Ofranda soprendo suvia Sapacante legate Rakatos copratemante get to fire Just open your heart unto My God it is to you we have come to tonight Makateli veros capanta Sepireno sofenicati Sapacanto rovenatalia Holy capa sopranatendo frenatale get a boy Marando sofrata Sekatos ketile veri Erendo skopata pelia Asakate veliro Esofranda sakatelia I perceive that there will be angelic ministers on in tonight's service Esofra sakenia Sakate rovasila tam pradea Ekatua tam preveli Manesko prata skalia Luteteli varatos prata Dorenda civili satata Lord, we will not enter you from moving in our midst tonight. Sakale rovai, manam prate sofreta silavan sakate. Sakela dosko predatelia. Take the stage and take the crowd. Emo savrata skedoa. Do not stop in the crowd. Take my heart, O God. As a venicora sateli. Sabile vesua. Sabrando scopenia, emorafen again to Frenetelia, because those who the Father sought after are they that we worship him in spirit and in truth. Makanda Faria, take over Aselia, Esocoprenda Sibilicata, Manento Villa Radia, Sabaka de Peracato, Prada Damelakai, Esoprada Sebretus Cabana. Asakane re, erwada simanga binatai, esofranda saketu para satila, asakate kreto toska bambara, menendo fratela garuata skabenena, erwade skopate felika nende kreto toska baya, maikele to frata skila redos sabenekai, o manan se fila kalia, erendo sofrana telega de boa, Erados ko frana take tos ko paya Aye tos ko felea Can I give you an assurance tonight We have come to the God that answers prayer Our Father does not stop prayers Esu frata skelia Can you lift up your incense unto heaven tonight Saka le koto ponte feli Ruata skate redo Erando sabile te via Lorata skate kenia Eruata sambe te Kenya, eso sofra ta telia nda skatelia. The prayer of the sender ascend to heaven in the as a smoke and is receiving a golden vase. Eso prata skatelia tonight. God is going to breathe upon your prayers. Aso prata skedo subraya mena sofra te tele bo sapata sapete kada prata taya. Etu vrenda sima ezam brave so vila da sati asaka tele pun sati la makai elo faria asaka te so bia manaya esate le verie mo sikai esempri no sofra ta kanda prina reda peta kada buata ya aranda sofra ta ke mo sebi manan sofra da si le vera do sabai ese peta kada ruata ste. Esanda kabe boa abanda filanzograi sabreso suvra da santa kai sapeke to krovesile esu zavra das katelia regardless of the happenings ativa rosa bante keno asakate riatosko ede pila moto frata skile esu bande menio asakata kata vora veda erando sko prevele telega da prota sade. Aman sapila mvateke Itu fara da skedo provena telemana skopa Asaka teke no komplete tile Isu vene sakili manako Manantibi le katu Arindo siva telia Epeke no sofrena telega boasai Asaka teke do prota Arando sofrena telekana Elendo frete tile barakati 
Sato souffre de Telia, à l'offre de Telia, à sa grande salia, Retos Coprana, et ce qu'elle nous ferait, whatsoever has held you bound. Tonight there is a word for your deliverance, there is a word, there is a word for you. Asakale Grotoa, do not miss your catch up moment. Makateli, Asufratila, cause that your spirit will be aligned with the frequency of Zion. Asakabe, Arwasamate, Etubranatai, Asedeka, Watai, Erambo Valley, Ayakadekadebo. It's a very good sovereign. Sapao. It's a very good sovereign. The Lord of God. The King of God. Yahweh. Sapao. Veseli varu saveli kai. Isu vanda sivili kante peli. Isu vati katila. Sami katuza veli karata. Marate sofo sae. Ese makunda vati. Let your growth and tell ya, a second of growth of Rada. God is bringing you out of that debt. A sofrana sekeli, a la grando sofrata, a sacate keduvaria, a retoscopan de crena suva. Lastly, can you ask the Lord to put your word in the heart of his servant? A cecilia is counsel, a rua sai, sabila cano growth and ear, a sofrata scati. Sabika leveni arwata skatelia maximize the atmosphere asakale rove arwata skapelete sabika na krata to fenika emana kada fire esu prata skopela sibai arwanda fenika di sababelo ezele para na sokope arwata skapenika leto arwata skanda kada bokra na telia. Can you begin to make a prophetic declaration upon our forthcoming crusade in the land of Kute? It is your time. Can you go ahead? Sapara, the Lord said, Tell ya, Lord, we ask that you go ahead of us. Makateli, Elwata Skate, Sabara Katakai. Thank him for the investment of the prayers. Thank him for the harvest of souls. Thank him for the notable miracles. Thank him, thank him. Asaka Telia, Elasu Marai, Managrato Sopradadela, El Sombrana Sakape, Itu Vaina Karia, Elato Sopienda Kani, Asaka Rapena Kadi, El Sopradila Radua, Asaka Takatele, El Remena Sopraya, O Maganda Plena Felicate, El Wata Satele, Dua Tila, Sabakate Felicu. Emano seventa credatura faya Saka telega de contrate Zilam fratos go sala Erambos que te pilanda A saka telivosa Isa silan de crino E timba kilando sa faya Sebe de que no cofe de cael E sus aratas que te boza Alambra na sofre de telebando E saka cane E tu vaya Go ahead and lift up your hands Begin to magnify the name of the Lord Starting from tonight, your deliverance has come. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Come on, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Kalibre do shada kana mana mana dos. Ipele na 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 ma wo shada kalibre de. Jesus, we give you praise. Kalibre ni na 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 dos abegadia. Jesus, we thank you. We give a praise, Lord. Ah. I will never be the same. I've touched your grace. My life must change. I will never be the same. I will never be the same. 
I've touched your grace My life must change I will never be the same I've touched your grace My life must change Come on, raise your hands and I'm a Bless your name, Jesus. After tonight's service, my life and my destiny will, rem will never remain the same. Woo! I will never. I will
glory feels like heaven on it. Come on, let me hear it. I can hear you from this side. Something is moving. Something is changing. Hey. Something is moving. Your promotion is changing to the higher level. Is moving. Hey. See his glory. HIV is moving out in the name of Jesus. There is lightning and thunder, miracles of wonders, sound of man of waters, heaven on it.
ourselves right now. We are going to use ourselves as a point of contact in the church, the ministry. Let's put our hands on our head. The hands of God is upon our life. I don't know about you. I don't know how you feel it. But inside of me, it's kicking. Sheba God. Are we ready? Hey, on EGM. everyone thank you wow uh, 
I want to say a very big thank you to our Father, my Father, Apostle Michael Oroko, for this beautiful opportunity to bring the counsel of God up to God's people. I don't take this for granted at all. Hallelujah. You know, we've been treating it, this topic. This is a fourth week seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Hallelujah. Seed time and harvest. We've heard, we've received God's word concerning this very topic, this very powerful and remarkable topic from different perspectives. But before we go on, I want us to pray and ask God to reveal this topic to us. Because it can remain a head knowledge and it will produce no results. We're going to pray. Pray with all of your heart. And say, Lord, reveal this to me. Because this is the secret of having our desired outcome. Can you pray and say, Lord, reveal this to, reveal this to me. Reveal this to me. Seed time and harvest. Father, we thank you. We ask from our hearts that you reveal it to us. May it come to us as a revelation. Not as one of those things we know. But something that has been revealed to our spirit. A truth that has been revealed to our spirit. That we may walk in it. And have the results. To prove that your word is true. In the name of Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, seed time and harvest. It's God's way of putting his power in the hand of man. This is God giving every man the power to choose the outcome of his life. When God created man and put this law in motion, what God was saying is that whatever outcome you have from this day forward is what you have chosen. You may have an outcome that you don't want. An outcome of pain, frustration, stagnation. What God is saying is that you chose that outcome. You may say, no, it is not possible. I can't be in this pain, crying day and night. And you are telling me that I chose this situation. The word of God cannot lie. Because the power to create your outcome has been given to you. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, I think we should look at that. We'll see what God did when he created man. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 28. And God blessed them. When God created man, the Bible said, and God blessed them. God empowered them with an ability. And God said unto them, this is how God blessed them. He spoke his word into their life. He spoke his word 
into the man that he has created. This is, you know, the word of God is the power of God. When God wants to put thing, want, want to put a thing in motion, he speaks his word because he knows that his word does not come back to him void. Unfulfilled. And God blessed them. He empowered them with an ability and said to them, he said, be fruitful. The man that God created, when God created you, he said, he blessed you. He empowered you and said, be fruitful. It is the word of God. The word of God that is put in motion and imparted, installed in every man that he created. That a man should be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth. But we remain at be fruitful and then multiply. God said be fruitful and multiply. So God is saying for you to bear fruits and increase in the fruits. He said I have blessed you. I have empowered you with the ability to make that possible. And as far as the earth remains, the Lord is saying this empowerment and ability of the spirit of my word remain forever. If you will multiply, if you will be fruitful, he said, I have blessed you. The seed to be fruitful is in his word, the blessing of God upon your life. Because for you to be fruitful, you must first have a seed that must be planted and then multiply in it. And God bless them. The blessing is the seed. And he has imparted into every man. If, you know, if we go backward to Genesis 11, we'll see what the same thing God said that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 20, he said that to the animals. He said, be fruitful. Because he knows what God was saying. When God was blessing them and was saying that word, he was putting in them the seed for multiplication. The seed to produce whatever results that they wanted. Glory to God. And God said, be fruitful and multiply. So we are seeing here that God has blessed the man that he created. He has empowered him with an ability and he has given him the seed. Remember, the source is God. So he gave the man the seed from him who is the source. And he said, now I have given you the seed. Go and recreate your word. Go, because God created man in his image and in his likeness. He said, this man, you, I created you in my image and, and in my likeness. God is a creator. So when he created the man, he imparted in him the seed and said, now go forth and recreate your word. Go forth and create the outcome of your life. And nothing can change this word that the Lord has spoken as far as this earth remains. is the empowerment of the word of God. Glory to Jesus. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. God ended his work. Which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day. From all his work which he has made. Can we look at New Living Translation if you have this? If you have this in New Living Translation. He said, and God blessed the seventh day. And declared it holy because it was the day he rested. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. God finished he finished his work of creation. When he created man and gave the man the ability to recreate the outcome, to recreate his world and create the outcome he desires. The Bible said in chapter 2 verse 2, he said God finished. So God right now is not doing anything. 
He's sitting on the throne and he is the Lord of all. Because he has created you and I and has given us the power to create every other thing. Anything you desire, he said, go ahead and create it. Hallelujah. God finished his work. So when you go cry and say, Lord, change this situation. This is not the outcome that I desire. The devil had made this. The Lord will say, go back. I have given you the ability. I have finished my own work. He said, now recreate the outcome of your life. This may sound very hard to believe. But this is the truth of the word of God. That God has given you the ability to create the desire of your life. And right now, what he is watching and expecting you to do is to create the outcome that you desire. If you look at the outcome and it is not what you have desired, he said, don't go fighting the fruits because you cannot do anything about it. Go back and change the seed. Because when you have planted, if it has grown and has yielded the seed, the fruit, you may not like what you are seeing, what you are experiencing. He said, quit crying about it. In you is a seed to recreate, to replant and bear the fruit that you desire. You know, some people, they have a, they, an outcome that somehow this is not what they want. But now they are here and they cry from year to year wondering, Lord, do something about this. And they're wondering, why is this thing still remaining? It's because you're looking at the fruit. You can't change the fruit. The only thing that you have the power to do is to plant another seed. Change the seed. Change the seed. If you can plant a different seed, then you can have a different outcome. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. Thank you, Father. You know, this is the story of Noah. This is God. After God has destroyed the earth with water, what happened was because man, wickedness has filled the earth. God created man and in, installed in the man the defaults to sow. Man was a being, a sower by nature. Whether he is creating, whether he is sowing consciously or unconsciously, he is just sowing. And man, because man has fallen because of the sin of rebellion and disobedience, man took up another nature and then man filled the earth. Where, though he was trying to do something right, he couldn't because his nature has become the nature of the fallen man. And so all that could flow from the man was wickedness and wickedness filled the earth. Because in him is a seed to plant and then to have the fruit, to have the harvest. And so man was planting, man was sowing and everywhere, multiplying everywhere and everywhere was filled with wickedness. And he repented the, the Lord that he created man. And God said, and God destroyed the earth with water. Genesis chapter 8 verse 2. After the destruction, this is what God said to Noah. He said, why the earth remained? This is after the, after the earth was destroyed with flood. And then Noah and his family came out. And the Bible said, Noah made a sacrifice to God. And God spoke and said, and said to Noah, he said, why the earth remained? He said, seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. The same thing that he told Adam and Eve in Genesis. He told them that be fruitful and multiply. We're going to look at it where God was telling Noah the same thing. Because he knew that the ability to recreate and create the outcome that Noah and his family and his descendants and his descendants 
will have. Their ability will be in his word. And then he spoke it to them and said, be fruitful and multiply. But before he said that, he said, why the earth remaineth? He said, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. He said, this shall not cease. Because the world, the earth, will run in this oppression that has been put in place. It will not cease. If you desire any outcome, he said, go back and sow the seed that will give you the outcome that you desire. Glory to God. There is no one that does not have a seed. There is no one created by God that does not have a seed. So no one can say he can't sow. No one can say what he has sown, what he is reaping, he is not the one that sowed it. Hallelujah. Can we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10? The Lord is a supplier of seed, but it's our responsibility to plant that seed. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. He said, now he that ministers seed to the sower, both ministers bread for the food. Can we look at New Living Translation? He said, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. He is the one that provides. God is the one that gives seed to everyone that we sow. And then bread to the eater. And every one of us here has a seed that God has put in us. All you do, all you need to do is to plant the seed that you have now that is in you. You'll be wondering, do I really have a seed? What seed do I have? I don't have anything. You can look at yourself and you wonder, God, I don't have anything. There is no way I'll have a seed. He said, God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. He said, in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest. There's a translation I'm looking for. Can we look at the message translation? most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meal is more than extravagant with you. He said he gives he gives you something you can then give away which grows into full form. Hallelujah. He gives he said, the one, the God that gives you seed to plant and then gives bread to the eater. The Bible said he will increase your seed. So what God increases is the seed that he has given to you. Because it, you are the one that he has given the commandment and the ability to be fruitful and then to multiply. If you want multiplication, if you want increase, all you need is is the seed to plant and then to increase. What God will increase is the seed that he has given to you. Hallelujah. And there are types of seeds. There are tangible seeds and there are intangible seeds. There are tangible seeds and there are intangible seeds. The tangible seed, let's look at the intangible seed first. Some of the intangible seed are your thoughts. That's why you can say, I don't have any money. I don't have anything with me. How are you telling me that this outcome that I have, I am the one that sowed the seed that is producing these results that I have. One of the intangible seed that has been given to every man is his thoughts. The Bible said, you are the outcome of your thoughts. As a man thinketh, so is he. 
So your thought is one of the intangible seeds. You may be ignorant of it. You may not know. You may be sowing it unconsciously. But there's, a, there's an oppression and a process that has been put in place that does not know if it is sown unconsciously or consciously. Or if it is sown in ignorance, it will produce the results of the seed that has been sown. You see, that's why some people wonder, they will say, this is not the outcome that I want. No, it is not possible. They can even look at God and say, God, why is this thing happening to me? This is, not the, this is not the life that I desire for myself. The Lord is saying, there are seeds that have been given to you. They are intangible and you've been sowing the wrong seed. So the outcome of your life that you are seeing is as a result of the seed that you have been sowing. So thought is one of the intangible seeds. Your words is another intangible seed, but very powerful. If you have the wrong thoughts and the wrong words, the outcome of your life will be wrong. You see, what you say, you will have it. Whatever you say, whatever you say, he doesn't say whatever you say jokingly. He doesn't say whatever you say ignorantly. He doesn't say whatever you say seriously. Whatever you say, whatever you say, you shall have. Glory to God. Your imagination is an intangible seed. The picture of your mind. Those pictures are they pictures of fear. The imaginations of your heart are they the imagination of the pictures of fear. The pictures of frustration. You may be dressed very good, looking wonderful, but sometimes this fear comes in you and you wonder, my life is going to end miserably. And sometimes you see yourself withdrawing from people. You're wondering. It is because of the pictures of your heart. And these are the seeds that you are planting. Just before you know them, just before you know it, you will see that the experiences of your life will become an experience of frustration. Fears, ups and down. Because that is the seed that you've been planting. And there are seeds of emotions. So we're looking at thoughts as an intangible seed. Your word as an intangible seed. Your imaginations, the pictures of your heart as an intangible seed. Then the emotions. Your emotions as an intangible seed. And these seeds will produce the results that will ultimately be the outcome of your life. You see why so many people are confused, wondering, how am I always in church, serving God, and somehow the outcome of my life is not what I've desired? No. If your heart has taken the shape of the word of God, if your heart is filled with the truth of God's word, if all that is in your heart is that which is pure, which is good, if your heart is filled with that which is above, your heart will be above only. Challenges will come, but those days of challenges will not last. Because there is a programming that your thought, there's a seed that your thought has planted. Glory to Jesus. And there are tangible seeds. And this is the one that most people know the resources that we give. It can be money, it can be anything, something that anybody can see. But I tell you, these are the least seed any man can plant. These are the least that produces the outcome of your life. Because you can plant, you can be given physically, you can be given tangible seeds, but the seed 
of your thoughts, the seeds of your imaginations, the seed of your words can be contradicting everything that you are giving. Your life will take the shape of the thought, imagination, and the words of your mouth. That's why what makes the physical, the physical, the tangible seeds effective are the intangible seeds. And this is the one that the Lord blessed. We have, I have blessed you. He said, be fruitful and multiply. When God was saying that, he didn't give them anything physical. But he was imparting into their spirits the seed to produce the outcome of their life. If your life is full of sickness, don't worry about the sickness. The sickness is only an outcome. Let's go back to the seed. Change the seed. Change the seed. If you're being disappointed from every business and you're wondering why is everybody turning me down? Why am I being so disappointed? Don't worry. The disappointment is only an outcome. Let's go back to the seed. Plant a different seed. Plant a different seed. Let the word of God be your seed. Glory to Jesus. Is a God made man with a default mode of sowing. I've said that. Every man on earth is a sower. Can we look at Deuteronomy chapter 30? Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. He said, I've said before you life and death. God have made, he made every man a sower. He said, you are a default sower. You just sow. Whether you are sowing consciously or unconsciously, you are a sower. He said, I've said before you life and death. He's in motion already. He's before you. But because of his love and mercy, he said, choose life that you may live. If you choose not to choose life, you will produce death in everything you do. Because it has been set. It has been set. Blessed. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. If they choose not to be fruitful, God can't do anything about it. If they choose to live in lack, God can't do anything about it. But he has set it in motion and he has said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Glory to Jesus. You know, after every time of planting, there's always a waiting season before the harvest. After every time of planting. There's always a waiting season. A time of waiting before the harvest. So we have the sowing season. The waiting season. And then the harvest season. Maybe we should look at what happens in the sowing season. Because some people, you can sow the right seed. If you don't understand the process and what happens in your time of waiting, you can go back and begin to harvest all that you have sown. What a sad thing. You can be so hungry and you say, what? my God, I have just planted the seed of yam that I would have eaten. And you will go back to the place where you have planted it and begin to dig out that which you have sown. So many people unconsciously have done that because they don't understand the process of waiting. There's something that happens during the time of sweating. Hallelujah. Can we look at Mark chapter 4 verse 26? Message translation. The book of Mark 4 verse 26. Is it then Jesus said, God's kingdom is like a seed thrown on the field by a man is like a seed is like a seed thrown on the field on the field by a man okay who then goes to bed and forget about the seed the seed who and forget about it the seed sprouts and grows he has no idea how it happens the time of waiting are times where you don't have power over this. 
The only power that has been given to you at the time where you sow the seed. But what happens between the time of sowing and the time of reaping? You don't have power over it. You just see. You are just waiting. You can't speed it up. You're wondering what is going to happen now. I've sown my seed. Was the time when all your trust will be on the Lord. You know, while I was preparing for this message, the Lord said he's going to be speaking to these ones. He said, this set of people, you have sown seeds. You have sown seeds. And right now, it's almost like you are discouraged, wandering. I have been sowing seed. What is happening to my harvest? It's as if the harvest is far away. It's not coming. You look at your environment. Everything about your life looks like someone. You're wondering. I believe this scripture. I'm sowing a seed. What is happening? You may just be in your waiting process. There's a season of waiting before the harvest. He said, who then goes to bed and forget about it. Then seed sprouts and grows. He has no idea how it happens. The earth does it all without his help. It happens without his help. First, a green stem of grass. Then a bud. Then the ripened grain. When the grain is fully formed, he reaps the harvest time. Welcome, sir. Hallelujah. You see, this is a waiting season. The power, the seed has been given to him. And the power was given to him to sow and then have an outcome. Your seed may be right. The environment where you have planted it may be right. But there's a season which is called the waiting season. Where you do not have anything to do about it. He said, this one, you will go and sleep. Can you go back to 28? You see, the earth does it all without his help. He has sown the seed. He has gone home to sleep. Now it is a process of waiting that is going on. He doesn't have anything to do here. He cannot dictate the time of harvest here. He cannot have, he can't, there's a, there's, there's, a force that is in place right now. And he said, first, the green leaves, the green stem of grass, then a board, then the ripened grain, 20, 29. He said, when the grain is fully formed, he reaps the harvest time. This is where his responsibility comes in. You see, he has a responsibility to sow the seed that has been given to him. And then the responsibility to take the harvest. But the waiting season, he does not have anything to do about the seed. But there are things that happen to him as he waits. Can we look at two things that happen to a man that is waiting after he has sown the seed? Waiting is God's giving opportunity to deepen your relationship with him in prayer meditation and studying of the word of God. The reason this is very important because sometimes the waiting season might be long. It may look like what's happening is taking a long time. But something is being formed in you. Patience. Waiting is a time of preparation and growth. Can we look at Psalm chapter 27 verse 4? A time of preparation. And growth. Psalm 27, verse 4. Amount of time. It's the one thing have I desired of the Lord that I was, will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. 27, verse 14. It's a wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. He said, wait, I say, on Proverbs 3, verse 5. 
He said, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Trust God for the, from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. It's a time of patience. Trust the Lord. Trust the process. Trust the one that has the power to bring harvest to the seed that you have sown. Trust him. Be patient. For he is faithful. He will not fail. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Waiting builds your character. Hallelujah. Can we look at Romans first? Romans chapter 8 verse 5. Romans chapter 8 verse 5. So those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscles. I think, can we go to King James Version? Hallelujah. He said, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Glory to God. Waiting builds character and humility. James chapter 1, 3 to 5. As we look at that, we'll be on our feet and begin to tell God is a knowing this that the trying of our faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So the time of waiting is a time where character and humility is built. So the Lord is preparing you for that harvest which he has assured you. So that when the harvest come, it will not be that that will destroy you. You can have it with, because you have become a man that has been thoroughly furnished during the time of waiting. Can we bow our head as we pray? Thank him for his word. That first he has given us the power to choose the outcome of our life through the law of sowing and reaping. And as we sow in obedience and wait for the harvest, we are formed and built by the word of God. Father, we give you praise. For your word produces results in our life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for your word. We thank you for it has brought so much light to our spirits. Your word has come to build us up. To give us an inheritance amongst them that are sanctified. Our lives can never be the same. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we've prayed. Amen. 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 Wow, what a word. The scripture um, Pastor Dan just read on waiting on the Lord. If you read from the original rendering where David was writing, he said, Wait. Wait expectantly on the Lord. You see, this subject is so important. And even as we are about to give our offerings, it's a kind of seed that we are sowing. The question is, when you sow, can you chew the eyes of the Spirit? We talked about the intangible realities. Can you chew the eyes of the Spirit, see the expected end? Can you through the eyes of the Spirit see that God receives your offering? It was an offering of sacrifice, a vow. Why don't you just put it together? And in a few minutes, shut your eyes and hallow that gift. It's a hallowed gift. It's a hallowed gift. Talk to your Father. Jesus said, I ascend to my Father and to your Father. To my God and to your God. Talk to him. Say, Father, this is another opportunity for me to worship. 
another opportunity for me to show gratitude for me to keep my vows thank you father so heavenly father we thank you for these seeds that you have given unto us we take from this measure as acts of thanksgiving to you and we say be glorified in our lives be enthroned over our finances the devourer is rebuked for our sake we continue to advance we continue to advance we are increased on every side our bands are secured thank you father in jesus mighty name we pray our online audience the account numbers are being put up for you to also participate in this opportunity of seed sowing you may cast your seed Come and lift up our voice and just pray in the Holy Ghost. Just bless the name of the Lord in your language. Bless the name of the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. <laughs> Give you river, oh let it 
to river flow mm. It begins to bring our rhythm into life It's a life-giving river Oh, let it flow right here
glory. Why not lift your hands one more time and just bless the name of the Lord. Give him glory tonight. Honor him, magnify him, exalt his name. Thank you, precious one. We give you glory. Thank you for the honor of fellowship. Thank you for the privilege of participation in your agenda. Again, we have come to receive of your engrafted word with meekness for the saving of the soul, for empowerment, for invigoration, for upgrade, for strengthening, for greater impact. Take all the glory, Lord. Take all the honor. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just tell him how much you love him. Just tell him. I know you know he knows, but tell him. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We bless your name. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name forever. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. You may sit down. Thank you, choir. be seated we are still on our journey Luke chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 3 we are on a series and we are trying to examine the things that are most surely believed there are many things we believe but these ones are most surely believed they are a must he said for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed amongst us. Next verse. It says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Next verse. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write on today in order, most excellent Theophilus. And so we said, there is a body of knowledge that our conviction rests upon. We are not just a mindless people, fanatical group of people, running up and down, affirming what we are not sure of. There is a definite body of knowledge. And for everyone who will be effective in God's agenda, you must be deeply rooted in these truths. And so we outlined them and we began dealing with them one after the other. We've looked at the doctrine of God. And in dealing with the doctrine of God, most cardinally we looked at his essential attributes. We looked at his moral attributes. We looked at his offices. And we also looked at the mystery of the Godhead. Glory to God. I outline about seven essential attributes. I mean, these are the things that makes God, God, the God we believe in. Because we took time to deal with a lot of things, the heresies about God, 
the divergent belief systems from polytheism to monotheism and all of that before we began dealing with the attributes that define the one and only true God. And we said there were about eight essential attributes. We said God is eternal. That means he has no beginning, he has no end. He has always been. There's never a time where God was not and there will never be a time where God will not be. And then we looked at the fact that God is self-existent. He is the reason for his own existence. He doesn't depend on anything to exist. He doesn't draw meaning out of anything. He is the meaning for his own existence. Exodus 3.14 I am that I am have sent you. 1 Timothy 1.17 He is called the eternal God. And then we looked at the fact that God is immutable. That means it does not change and it cannot change. Malachi 3.6 I am the Lord. I change not. So you the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, you are not consumed. And then we looked at the fact that God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. All power dwells with him. There's nothing impossible with and to God. And we said it's not just all powerful. He also has the power to put his power under his will. That's why the power of God is not corrupt. There are people that have a measure of power and the power corrupt them because the power rule them. But God has authority to put his power under his will. And then we looked at the fact that he's omniscient. He knows all things. You can't teach God. There's nothing God can learn anymore. He is the author of all knowledge and he knows all things. There's nothing in this life or in creation that you can teach God. He can't learn even if he wanted to. He knows all things. Glory to God. And so we said he knows all things at all times in all places. And he doesn't just know all things in all places. He also knows all things within himself. <laughs> I mean, only God can be like that. Do you know everything in yourself? How big is your molar teeth? Have you seen it before? <laughs> Have you seen your lung before, your kidney? God knows every detail about everything inside himself. And he also knows every detail about everything outside of him. Glory to God. And we said God is omnipresent. It means he's everywhere, at every time, in every time. So as I'm talking to you now, there is nowhere God is not. That is at every time. But we said beyond at every time, he's also everywhere, in every time. That means God is still in yesterday and God is already in tomorrow. You left yesterday to today. God is in yesterday. And he's with you in today and he's already in tomorrow. You will join him to, in tomorrow. Glory to God. So he's omnipresent. And that's not all. We said he's also omnibenevolent. That means only God can truly love unconditionally. And we said this dimension of love is not just a feeling. It's the ability to give himself unconditionally. That's why I said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God has the power to give himself. And we said, these attributes define his essence. That's what makes him God. And then we looked at the moral attributes. And we said, the moral attributes are the attributes that God can share with his creation. Those are the ones he shared with us. Because when you study God, you are going to find out that God is both deity and divine. It's because he is deity that only he can be worshipped. But when we say divine, we mean anything that comes from God. For example, if a revelation comes from God, it is called divine revelation. And so we say anything that carries God's moral attributes is divine. This is why we are divine beings. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. And he said, he has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by them we might become partakers of his divine nature. So we partake of divine nature. That's why we are divine having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. So we are divine, but we are not deity. 
Because we only have his moral attributes, we don't have his essential attributes. I am not omnipotent, I am not omniscient, what I know is quite insignificant. I am not omnibenevolent, I am not self-existent, only God is. So he is deity, only he should be worshipped. But I have his moral attributes. And what are the moral attributes? Number one, God is perfectly righteous. And that's the righteousness he put in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he said, He made him that was without sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 17, They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. So we have that nature of God. So our living and growing in righteousness is because we have that nature. Do you get that? There was a time when my son could not speak a word. But now he's beginning to speak little by little. So he has my nature and then he's growing to manifest my nature. So the reason God expects us to live righteous is because he has put his righteous nature in us. Glory to God. But he is the author of that nature. We only receive that nature from him. And then we say God is perfectly holy. That means he's incorruptible. You can't corrupt God. There's nothing that can defy his being. And so because of that, he is not just sinless, but he is in his own class. So there is nothing that is like, or there is none that is like unto God. He is separate in his own class. The love of God is different from the love of a man. The power of God is different from the power of a man. No matter how much you love, you can't love like God. So the way God loves is holy. No matter what you know, you can't know like God. So the way God knows is holy. He puts him in his own class where nothing can approach. That's a moral nature. And he also implanted that nature in us so that we too can grow into perfection. Are you seeing that? This is why one of the burdens of the apostles was to build the believer unto perfection. Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1 to 3. They wanted to grow the body into perfection because that nature has been imparted. And we also say God is faithful. It's part of his moral nature. He is trustworthy. He's reliable. If God tells you it is done, nothing can stop it from being done. If God gives you a promise, nothing can stop it. That's why Sinat calls him the promise keeper. If I promise you something, I may have the heart to do it, but I may lose what I promised you. And it can be stolen from me. I can tell you I'm coming to give you a thousand dollars. I'm driving to your house. I can misplace the money. And the money can be stolen from me. So it's not because I am not consistent in character. It's because I've lost it. But you see, God can't lose what he promises you. And in case that thing is not there, his creator, he will replicate it. That's why he keeps his promise. Because he has both the will and the capacity. So because of that, he's trustworthy and he is reliable. And that's not all. He is also love. So God does not just possess love. He is love personified. That's his nature. First John 4, 8 calls him love. So these are his moral attributes. And these are also his communicable attributes. So anyone who is of God must be righteous, must be holy, must be loving, and must be faithful. Because these things are the attributes of God that were communicated to his offspring. And that's not all. We also said God sits in offices that only he sits. Number one, his creator. Every other person can form. Every other person can be an inventor. But only one is creator. The difference between an inventor and a creator is that an inventor needs a raw material to produce something. But creators don't need raw materials. They can create something out of nothing. And only God sits in that office. So it is his office that makes him deity. Glory to God. His essential attributes makes him deity. His moral attributes make him divine. Glory to God. The second thing we said is that God is the author of life. Every other life comes from an existing life. You didn't appear, sir. You are a product of the merging between a spermatozoan and an ovary. That's how you came. But you see, God does not need anything to happen. He has always been. Every life derives from God. That's why he is God. Some people argue that there's no God. So, in case you can't convince them, to believe the one you believe. Tell them, the one that you refer to as the beginning, that's the one I'm talking about, whoever it is. 
Because no matter how you trace life back, you are going to meet the first author of life. That one is God. And it's an office. Only God sits there. So we took time to study who God is. And we also looked at the mystery of the Godhead. Because we said, essentially, God is one being. But existentially, he manifests as three persons. And the Bible advises us on how to understand this mystery. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20, it says we should go to nature. That the hidden attributes of God, even his eternal power and Godhead, is manifested by nature. That means nature has the capacity to reveal the mystery of the Godhead. And so we took water, for example. We said, chemically speaking, water is made up of two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of molecule, of oxygen. So it's H2O. That's the essence of water. But for water to manifest, it manifests in three forms. Either as solid called ice, or as liquid, or called water, or as gas called steam, depending on the temperature you are dealing with. Ice is not water. Water is not steam, physically speaking. That's existential reality. But chemically speaking, ice, water, and steam is the same. So we said, applying that principle, God is one person or one being, but it manifests in the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is God. So it's one God manifesting in three persons. Because of this revelation, we had to now begin to study the individual persons in the Godhead. And so we went to the doctrine of Christ. And so we studied the doctrine of Christ and there were four major things we looked at. Number one, we looked at his humanity. Number two, we looked at his deity or his divinity. Number three, we looked at his works. And then number four, we looked at his offices. Because Christ exists as God the Son, Son of God, Son of Man, and the Christ or the Messiah. And we said these three things or these three offices represent different responsibilities. We dealt with that. And then last week, we looked at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And also in dealing with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, we had to look at his, he, him as a person, now not as a man. Because the Holy Ghost is not a man, but he's a person. And we gave you four arguments to qualify a being who is a person. Number one, we said for you to be a person, you must have certain essential characteristics. And we listed five. Number one, you must have intuition. Number two, you must have rationality or a mind. Number three, you must have autonomy or a will. Number four, you must have emotion. And number five, you must have self-identity. And we showed from scriptures that the Holy Ghost has all of these five qualities. Apart from that, we also said the Holy Ghost is introduced by adjectives of a person. And so we looked at the Bible calling him he calling him him and then we also went further to look at the holy ghost carrying out functions that only persons carry out for example he leads he guides he teaches he can be offended and all of that those are attributes of a person and so we use that to justify that the holy ghost is a person and we said that's important because many people feel the holy ghost is a phenomenon and that's why they cannot have a relationship with him they think the holy ghost is a power they think the Holy Ghost is a feeling. They think the Holy Ghost is wind. So anytime they feel some kind of feeling, they become conscious of the Holy Spirit. When that feeling goes down, that, they, their consciousness of the Holy Ghost goes down. So their relationship with God fluctuates. But that's not what the Bible wants. It said the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship. We are supposed to walk with him continually. How are we going to do that? Except as we know he's a person. So we become sensitive to him. The way we cannot hurt somebody we love, that's how we won't hurt him. The way we, we respect the feeling of the people we love, that's how we respect him. This is how our relationship with the Holy Ghost begins to grow. Now, there are people you love that may be around you and you may not feel anything. So our relationship with him will go beyond feeling. So we took time to establish that and we established that the Holy Ghost is a person. And then we proceeded to also establish that the Holy Ghost is divine and his deity, his God, co-equal with the Father, co-eternal with the Father, and co-existent with the Father. And we use a few scriptures to justify that. Glory to God. Number one, we proved that he was part of the Godhead. 
Number two, we showed that all the essential attributes of God, the Holy Ghost possesses them. Number three, we saw the Holy Ghost bearing the titles of God. And number four, we saw the Holy Ghost doing the works that only God could do as far as scriptures was concerned. So we justified the Holy Ghost as God. And we also went further to talk about the five ministries of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to recap the five ministries of the Holy Spirit because I didn't touch them thoroughly. And then I go to our teaching tonight. Our teaching tonight is the doctrine of scriptures. The doctrine of scriptures. You know, there's been a bit of debate in recent times about scriptures. So tonight we do basic because the, the matter is deep. It's actually a robust theological matter. And we don't have all the time to deal with it here. But at least I'll give you some basics so that you have an idea. When you carry the Bible next time, you interact with it with better, better consciousness. Glory to God. So I pointed out five ministries of the Holy Spirit. The first ministry of the Holy Ghost, I said, is to... Now, of course... The ministry of the Holy Ghost we dealt with was the ministry of the Holy Ghost to man. There is the ministry of the Holy Ghost to nature and creation. There's the ministry of the Holy Ghost to even Jesus himself. You saw that the Holy Ghost did some things with Christ and all of that, but we specified man so that we can narrow down our teaching. And as touching man, we said there were five major ministries of the Holy Spirit. Number one, we said is the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I said, this ministry is important because without this ministry, none of us will even think it's necessary to have a relationship with God. None of us will feel sorry about our sins, and none of us will ever repent from our sins. John 16, 18. He said, when the spirit of truth is come, he shall reprove the world. John 16, 8. When the spirit of truth is come, he said, they shall reprove the word of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. If the Holy Ghost were not working, trust me, when you are done preaching, people will nod their head and say, where do I go? The reason people hear you and they are convicted, the reason people hear you and they repent, is not because you are an orator. It's because while you are talking, the Holy Ghost is working on their hearts. It's because of the Holy Ghost that you and I are here serving God. And it's because of the Holy Ghost that the world will be saved from sin. Because he came to convict the world and to engender repentance. Acts 2, 37. When they heard Peter speak, the Bible said they were pricked in their hearts. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? The Holy Ghost was the one responsible for pricking their heart and turning their hearts back to the Lord. The second ministry of the Holy Ghost, I said... Is the transformational ministry. After you turn to the Lord, you are going to see that your mind will still be unrenewed. The husband told a story, very heart touching story. He went to preach to a man, and the man wept in genuine repentance. And he was happy that God has found for himself another revivalist. Only for him to come the next day to follow up on the man. The man was deep in immorality. In fact, he stumbled on the man and the man was in the act. And he got confused. How can somebody who was weeping yesterday in repentance suddenly decline back to iniquity and is deep into what he was actively doing? And the Lord told him that his heart has been regenerated but his mind has not yet been renewed. If God renews your mind and if God does to your mind what he did to your heart, you will become an imbecile. In psychology, they call it tabula rasa. Your mind will become empty. So what God does is that when you are born again, he preprocesses, reprograms, and renews your mind. And that's the ministry the Holy Ghost will take you through over time. And I said there are five things that the Holy Ghost does in order to make your mind catch up with the frequency of your spirit. Number one, I said, the Holy Ghost will awaken you to the life of God. Ephesians 5.14, he said, Awake, awake, thou that sleepest, Christ will give thee light. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 14, he said, We have not received the spirit that is of this world, 
but we have received the spirit that is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. In verse 13 he said, which things also we speak, not with words, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Verse 14, he said, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, the first thing he does is that he awakens you to a new realm of life. He awakens you to new possibilities in God that you were not aware of. And I told you hilariously that most of you, the week you gave your heart to Christ, you saw that you had hunger. You could pray in tongues for four hours. You didn't know where the energy came from. You saw that you prayed for the sick. They were healed. After three months, you started struggling with prayer. You started praying for the sick. They were not healed. What happened? The Holy Ghost was giving you a taste of the possibilities that you will enter in God. So that you can now grow into it. Are you following? So the first thing he does is to open your heart. Some of you had many visions the week you gave your heart to Christ. In fact, you saw yourself like the evangelist that led you to Jesus. And you were preaching to millions of people. <laughs> but it's been 10 years. You are still in your neighborhood. That is a possibility, but you will grow into it. But you know why he shows you that? Second Peter 1 verse 4. He said he gave you exceeding great and precious promises that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. So that's the Holy Ghost way of wooing you. What he's showing you is not a lie, but you have to grow into it because the heir, so long as he's a child, is not different from a servant, even though he be Lord of all. I think this particular part, sisters, we know it better. When the man wanted to marry you, every morning he calls you, his voice is like honey. My dear, like you will come alive. How are you this morning? Did you sleep in heaven? Do people sleep in heaven? My beloved angel, I couldn't sleep all night. My soul was awake just to hear your golden voice. And the lady will be in front of the mirror. <laughs> when you now got married, he wakes up in the morning and say, Is there food? Will you sleep all day? Madam, go and cook food, let's eat. <laughs> well, the Holy Ghost won't deceive you like your husband. <laughs> if you have one who deceives, may the Lord encounter him. But but hear me now. The Holy Ghost will show you the possibilities you have in God. The moment you accept that possibility, he will now activate the second aspect. He will begin to now teach you the realities of the spirit. You know, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, Paul was praying for the church. He said that God may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know the hope of your calling the riches of the, of the inheritance of the saints in light and the exceeding greatness of his power that God wrought towards you when he raised you from the dead. That's when the Holy Ghost will now begin to show you. See these riches you have. It will take revelation to enter. So you need to start studying. This is where the Holy Ghost will tell you. See all of this power you are seeing. It will take prayer and fasting for your soul to ascend, to access it. The power is there. The, the wealth is there. The opportunities are there. But if your mind, you don't know the word of God and you don't pray, you won't access it. So every time you see something great in God, the Holy Ghost will present a consecration before you. That the things of the spirit have a protocol. Because God reveals his acts to the children of Israel, but his ways to Moses. You need to know how to access the dimensions of God. And that's when the Holy Ghost will become rigid with you. That those things you saw in the first three months of giving your heart to Christ, there is a way to route them. And if you don't route them, you will never have those things. Because now he wants you to grow. When your child is one year old, if he does his hand like this, you will give him anything he asks. When he starts talking, you will now start, King, Koboko will come out. Because there are some things you do now, there will be Koboko. The first time I touched my little boy, he looked at me in shock. I said, welcome to maturity. <laughs> the Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction will drive 
it out. I don't know. In Europe, they have new intelligence now. In America, they say they don't flog children. That's why they are growing in foolishness. Somebody wakes up and a man says, I feel like a woman. Try it here. You can't feel like that. You cannot feel like that. We have driven foolishness out of you. It is far. <laughs> the man looked at me. Welcome to maturity. There's a level where if you pee, they will beg you. Now, you will hear many languages. You will hear many. <laughs> Glory to God. So the Holy Ghost will teach you the realities of the Spirit. In John 16, 13, he said, I have many things to tell you, you can't receive it. How be it when the Spirit of truth is come? He didn't say he will give you. He will guide you. You will walk with him into those realities. So if you are not willing to follow, you will never access them. The realities of the Spirit. And then when you begin to follow, then the third thing will happen. He will begin to now renew your mind. That these things God is doing to you is for your own good. Is to help you grow. Titus 3 verse 5, Romans 12 verse 2. He begins to renew your mind so that you start thinking differently. Because you were not thinking like that before. He said, not by the works of our righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's what you find in Romans 12 verse 2. He said, be not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open faces, beholding us in the glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the living God. Some of you, before now, you didn't see need to pray until the Holy Ghost began to show you that your next level depends on your priesthood. Some of you, before now, you didn't see need to give to kingdom agenda. When they say give, you say, come on, get out. What do you mean? But now your mind is being renewed. You now see yourself as a son. And it's your responsibility to sponsor God's agenda. It's not because you are coerced. It's actually because your mind is being renewed and you are taking your place in the kingdom. The people in the world, they think they brainwash people in church. And I ask them a question. Do you know the quality of people who come to church? We have engineers, professors, doctors who are doing very well in their respective spheres. And then you think they brainwash them. You are so wise. You are not brainwashed. Is an eternity we will know who is the fool. You know, the Bible speaks of a, a, a foolish man who gathered his bam and said, Now my soul will rest. And they asked him, What is a soul? Come up. And he left his body. And they discovered that he was rich on earth, but poor in eternity. A wealthy man on earth was begging for a drop of water in eternity. He discovered eternity made his wisdom look foolish. This is why we follow the Holy Ghost here to renew our mind so that we can think like God. Because what God has in mind is for you to get to a level where you begin to operate like Christ. Because in 1 Corinthians 2.16, it said, we have the mind of Christ. Until you reach that frequency where you think what God thinks, you have not attained yet. Glory to God. So the Holy Ghost begins to renew your mind. Now, as the Holy Ghost begins to renew your mind, then he will now enter the fourth level where he begins to purge you. He begins to purge you. Or sanctify you. Malachi 3, verse 2 and 3. He says he will appear as a purger, as a refiner, and he will thoroughly purge the children of Israel so they can bring an acceptable worship to the Lord. He will purge you. Zechariah 13, verse 9. He says he will purge a third part of his people, and then he shall be their God, and they shall be his people. There are many times when the Holy Ghost will allow you to go through hardship. The furnace of fire. That is where you will now know how to choose God, even when the going gets tough. Because if you are, if your mind is renewed and you are not purged, you will think God is here just to pamper you. You will think God is here just for your needs, and you will not grow. You'll be a toddler. So a time will come when God will allow you to go through the fire, but you'll not be burnt. You will go to the waters. You will not be drowned. That was where Paul went to. In 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8. He said, I will not hide from you our sufferings that we faced when we were in Asia. He said, we had the verdict of death upon us. We despaired of life. He said, but in it we learned to trust God. So later when Paul was writing Philippians 3 verse 3. He said, we had the circumcision. That worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Having no confidence in the flesh. The flesh has been cut off. 
Do you know our Christianity now is to keep prophesying to people from January to December. That's why we don't have martyrs in our generation. That's why we don't have people who can bear the weight of kingdom. Because they have not been allowed to go through the furnace. But if the Holy Ghost will truly transform you, your faith, your belief will be tested. And it is in the valley of sanctification that your loyalty for, to God is tested. Paul said, I have mastered how to abound and to abase. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. When Job was tested, the wife came and said, ah, ah, what are you doing? Curse God and die. He said, why do you speak like one of the foolish women? Are we only going to receive good from God? When evil comes, we, are we supposed to deny God? No way. He stood his ground. Meanwhile, he didn't know that there was a contest in heaven. That the devil was saying, Job is serving you because of what you gave him. But Job proved that he had passed through the furnace. And so even when they lost everything, he stood his ground. The good news is that, number one, it wasn't God that brought evil on Job. He didn't understand correctly. Nonetheless, he didn't change his conviction. And the second good news is that in Job 42 verse 10, the Bible said God gave Job double for everything that he has lost. There is nothing you lose in trial that is lost. It's actually invested. When you come out of the furnace, it will be doubled. This is the secret of kingdom giants. When you find a man who is a champion, he was tested in the valley. Even Jesus had to be tested. Because there's no man that will pass the test of God that will not be tested. And this is where the Holy Ghost has the opportunity. It's in that trial that the Holy Ghost has the opportunity to sanctify you. When you are going through that trial, he can now come and say, but this malice you keep keeping, don't you think it's affecting your prayer? Now, because you are going through affliction, there will be no energy. You will say, yes, Lord, you will leave it. In that trial, he will come and tell you, this alcoholism, don't you think you should let go? You will say yes. You will give. So he can't sanctify you until you go through trials. So while you are going through trials, he will be cutting. He will be purging. He will be refining. By the time he does that, then the last thing he will now do is that anything he removes from you, he will kill the appetite. So that by the time you come out, that appetite no longer exists. When my mom died 14 years ago, I was disheartened. You know, before then, I thought I was a faith giant because we were healing the sick, preaching revival messages. I was, because I prayed every principle that the Bible teaches, I made sure I applied all of them meticulously so that I would get the result I was looking for. From seed sowing to prayers to laying of hands to prophesying to inviting those who are anointed so that they are anointed. I did all. She died. When she died, I said, Kai, there's something wrong. This thing we, we are doing is fanatism. I, I said, no. In that moment of despair, the devil came and whispered. I told you before not to suffer yourself. Come around, let's give you some excitement. And some good friends showed up. Abba, come, let's sit out this evening. Relax, relax. When we sat out, they gave me another type of spirit. One is Holy Ghost. The other one is beer. Alcohol is a spirit. And I went with star. I now wanted to show them I was a man. So the first time, I took like three bottles. I stood up. But I gathered myself and walked carefully and left. For one year, I was a, a, lager, a star. Star became a cooler of the tensions of the soul. <laughs> hey, my God. Mala kefesura bahata. Star Lagabi, when it's cold, there's a way it affects you. <laughs> See, never go out with English language to talk to people who are addicted. Go with power. See, those things, they, they awaken your senses. You, you go and look at a, a drunk or a halon, you say, repent. By talking, you are joking. You don't know what has bound his soul. Even the brain has been compared to walk in a certain way. Neurotransmitters have been activated. Appetites have been created. And in the evenings, that's the best time. But after one year, we went to a club. And as I was in the club, I heard the wages of sin is dead. <laughs> the word came out of the war. It came out and entered me. I didn't know where fear came from. The appetite died. I walked out of that place. 
You drink again, the same thing now becomes bitter. Huh? What's going on here? You try it again, it's no longer working. So you are not stopping it by discipline. You are stopping it because the mortifier has done its work. The appetite has died, so you can't taste it anymore. If a man is truly transformed, this is what God does to him. If you do resolution, forget, you will go back. But if the appetite dies, there's nothing to attach itself to anymore. And so that's the last thing the Holy Ghost does when it begins to transform a man. Romans 8, 11. The Bible spoke about the one who mortifies. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it says, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. So what he's doing here is that he's reprogramming your body. Go to verse 13. It says, if we live in the flesh, if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we, through the spirit, mortify the deeds of the flesh, then we shall live. So the first four things the Holy Ghost does is to awaken your senses to God. Then the last thing he does is to kill your appetite. Mortification is what they do to the dead in the mortuary. The appetite becomes frozen that it can no longer respond. When appetites die, then you know that transformation is complete. This is the second ministry of the Holy Spirit. The third ministry of the Holy Ghost is the helps ministry. Now that you are transformed, the Holy Ghost now begins to help you as touching matters of your destiny. Because as you now go out to navigate destiny, you are going to see many afflictions, many battles, many warfares. Now, those warfares are not necessarily school of process. They are the hindrances that the devil creates around your destiny. And so the Holy Ghost will need to give you help to arise beyond them. The causes in your bloodline will be dormant until the day you want to fulfill purpose. That's when they will rise up. You will see sickness that they can't trace the root. You will see stagnation. Even if somebody gives you one million today, after one week, the money will develop wings and disappear. You will be in one spot for 10 years, working harder than everybody you know, but you go nowhere. In fact, the more you struggle, the more you sink. It's like standing in mud. It's better to be still. If you try to struggle, you will sink. This one is not a school of process. They are the wicked traps that the devil creates. Either using demons or men, wicked men, to make sure that your destiny goes nowhere. It's because of this that the help of the Holy Ghost now comes. So that you can fulfill destiny, the presence of the devil, wicked men, or antagonistic systems notwithstanding. Nothing is able to stop you anymore because you would have found help that is yonder. John 14, 16, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. The word is orphanos. He said, but I will send the paraclete, alos, paracletos, another comforter of the same kind. And like I told you, there are seven synonyms of the word comforter. Number one is helper. So any area of your life where your strength is not enough, the Holy Ghost will show up and become your strength. That's why you see that some of the successes you recorded is not because of your ability. You can't explain. There's always a gap that language can cover for. You just know that something happened for this thing to have happened. That's the help ministry of the Holy Spirit. And if God does not help us, we will fail. I've told you before, any man you see standing is standing because he's helped of God. And this is why you must be quick to acknowledge God. The Bible said, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He's not given to man that walketh to order his step. We are full of insufficiencies. This is why the Holy Ghost comes. He said, we don't even know how to pray for as we ought to. Even the prayer that is an anchor. He said, there are realms in life where we have deficiency in knowledge to pray. He said, but how be the spirit of him, the help spirit. He said, he helpeth our infirmities with groanings. Because there are times when you can't even pick the frequency. So the Holy Ghost himself begins to pray literally through you. With groanings that cannot be uttered. So that by all means, you don't fail. Ah, sometimes I look back. I say, how did we get here? It must have been God. You will come to many junctions where you don't know what to do. But at the end of the day, you will arrive. And then you are wondering, how did I come here? A superior navigator showed up. His name is the Holy Ghost. You need help. There are many times when your next level is being decided in quarters where you don't even have a voice. 
you don't have a voice, you will not be invited. They just conclude about you. If you even hear that such a meeting happened, maybe it's 20 years later, when your life has been ruined. But in that same meeting, the Holy Ghost will enter somebody's heart. And somebody will rise up to your defense as though you are his first son. And the person may never see you to tell you. It's after five years they will tell you, bro, relax. Oh. That meeting where you were appointed, this is the man that spoke for you. Even if you go to thank the man, your thank don't mean anything to him. Do it out of courtesy, but he doesn't need your thanks because even himself doesn't know why he did it. There was an ancient spirit that whispered into his soul because the heart of kings is in the hands of God. He can tilt it in any direction. <laughs> ah! for good to them that love God. Even those who think they want to spoil things for you at the end of the day when they finish that thing will now position you where you should be seen. He said if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified. There's a spirit always walking behind the scene for your advantage. His name is the Holy Ghost. That's why you must have when Paul spoke, these are wise men the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the ability of God. The love of God. That's the consolation of the spirit. And they now added the fellowship. You don't receive the fellowship of the spirit and go. You stay with it. You stay with it. He's the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. He alone. He alone. The fathers of faith. I follow the fathers. One of the things I do, the Bible says, be a follower of them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. In following the fathers closely, studying their materials, listening to them, and sitting at their feet, there are three prayers I learned. And they, be, they have become one of the foundations of my success. Number one is, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I learned that one from Pastor Iya Deboe. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Number two is Lord, have mercy. <laughs> have mercy, have mercy. Because you don't know where you are. Is it not when it's shown to you that you will know? Have mercy, Lord, have mercy. And the third one is, thank you, Father. Thank you. Because you can't outdo God in thanksgiving. The Bible said, a thousand falls by your side, ten thousand by your right hand. He shall not come near you. That means the re attacks were not allowed to come near you. Ten thousand, eleven thousand attacks have been stopped from coming near you. The one you are receiving and you say you receive, they left that one because your faith can handle it. Any challenge you face is because God knows that one we raise will build your faith. The ones that will destroy you didn't come near you. I'm telling you, if he did, you'd have been destroyed. He said there are arrows that fly by day. There are destruction that waste in noonday. <laughs> you don't know what's happening. But he shields you as the mother hen covers the cheeks. 
Lift your hands and honor the Lord. <laughs> Meanwhile, hear me. You will not fail. Because it's not by power. It's not by might. It's by the Spirit. He alone is worthy of our praise. Before we continue, Lord, help me. Help me. Men are laden with infirmities. We need help. And even those that God is perfecting, they have too many enemies to fight. Lord, help me. There are some people who are hundred times bigger than you. You have not done anything to them. But they say they won't rest until you are destroyed. They are bigger. You can't fight them. Until God rises for you, you are finished. And then there are some things you are going through. You cost it with your hands. That's why you need to add, have mercy. Because mercy prevails over judgment. Maybe I cost it, I don't know. Have mercy. And then in addition to that, thank you Lord for the ones you have done before. I don't take it for granted. For me to teach about the Holy Ghost, you lose your service. There are two things I'm eternally grateful to God for. Many things, but two stands out. Number one is eternal life. Number two is the gift of the Holy Spirit. My God, what would we have done without it? Many things, but these two: eternal life, gift of the Holy Ghost. And then if you want to add righteousness, the ability to stand before God. He's the helper. He's the counselor. Counselor. There are many strategic decisions you want to take. Trust me, your brain is not built for it. The Bible says it's not given to man that walketh to order his step. You have not lived before. This is your first life. And this is the only one. How can you be sure the decisions you make now is right? Except as he comes to whisper to your heart. Most of the steps you took that landed you where you are, you know they came to you intuitively. It was the Holy Ghost that whispered to you. Don't go left, take right. And when you check your life, you find levels of precision that is beyond a studied decision-making process. Because it's your counselor. This is why we can't do without the Holy Ghost. He's your intercessor. There are many things you can pray about. Imagine the way the, the book of Romans 8.26 puts it. He said, we don't know what to pray for. That's one. And then number two, as we ought, 
That means even if you know what to pray for, you don't know the extent to pray it. That's why you have the Holy Ghost. Somebody is praying to pass an interview. He doesn't know there's an accident waiting for him on the way. You don't know. Your prayer point is wrong. That means your problem that morning is not the interview. It's how to survive 8.15. Because there's an accident on a junction by 8.15. Only the Holy Ghost can go beyond time. So the ones you didn't pray for is the one that prays them. He said, him that searcheth the mind of God, he maketh intercessions for us according to the will of God. The one who prays the accurate prayer is the Spirit. He's our intercessor. He's our advocate. He's the one that stands in our defense. Even when we err, we are not even aware of it. He's already raising the defense. There are activities going on on your behalf. Have faith in God, sir. Have faith in God. What is happening in your advantage is more than what you can know in a lifetime. So much is happening for you. Have faith. See, when you wake up in the morning, tell yourself, the devil can't kill me. I'm too surrounded. You have too many advantages. This is why you must be careful what you say. Don't open the door to the devil. He said, give me no place to the devil. Somebody wakes up, I'm finished. No, we don't finish. Because even when we don't know what to do, there's an advocate. There's an intercessor. There's a counselor. We are not finished. Every time you say you are finished, you are telling the Holy Ghost, I don't need your service anymore. Instead of saying, I am finished, say, Lord, have mercy. So that the one who knows more than you, we go to work. Our works, our, our words, can limit angels and the Holy Ghost. Too much is happening on your account that you are not aware of. That's why you must trust God and trust Him with the whole of your heart. He said He is faithful that has called us. Him that called it is faithful and He has put a lot of infrastructures in place to make sure that you don't waste. He said all that you have given to me, none is wasted except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. I'm in the hand of God. I'm engraved in his palms. The hairs of my head, they are numbered. Be bold. And apart from that, it's your strength now. When human strength fails, the strength of God kicks in. Because the Holy Ghost is there. And it's also your standby. When nothing works, he's there. And trust me, there will be a day when you will shut down. That's the day you cross to eternity. Even that day, the Holy Ghost will show up. And tell you it's not over. Absence from the body is presence with the Lord. I know the road beyond time. That's the assurance we have as believers. We hail you. Ah. We hail you. We hail you. Meditate on these teachings. It's not about the emotions you feel now. Let these things become the substance of your faith. As you think on them, He will open up deeper layers. The Bible says we are like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. God took time when He walked to prepare us for destiny. And trust me, what is working for you is bigger than you. He said, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. What is working with you is bigger than both you and the world you live in. But you must understand how to yield to God. The fourth ministry of the Holy Ghost is the empowerment ministry. As he's helping you, a point comes when he begins to enable you to become the help for others. And there are four things he does here. Number one, he comes to validate all your claims about God. Luke 24, 49. 
tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. Tarry until you are endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Not many days from now, you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power and you shall become proof producers, witnesses unto me. So when we stand up and we say we can't fail, the Holy Ghost will support that statement so that it doesn't, it doesn't fail. When we stand up and we say Jesus heals, so be healed, the Holy Ghost will rise up to support it so that it doesn't fail. If the Holy Ghost does not show up, the scriptures cannot be validated. So he came to validate our claims about God and scriptures. Number two, that's the first way he empowers you. So that the words of God you speak produce results. Number two, he came to prosper us in kingdom advancement. Because kingdom advancement requires a lot of prosperity. Zacharias 1.17 says, cry out loud. Say, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. We have a, a crusade in Kuje this weekend. Millions are going. As in, that me said, crusade is like pouring water in basket. That's how money goes in crusade. And there's no return. The only return is souls that are won. Millions, millions. Salvation is free. But preaching the gospel is highly expensive. Every time you want to advance kingdom, you will need to be empowered. He said in Deuteronomy 8, 18, you shall remember the Lord your God. It is him that gave the power to get wealth, to establish his covenant that he gave to your fathers, even unto this day. If the Holy Ghost does not show up, you will not be empowered. And this is not just financial empowerment. You need miracles because men want to see proof. All of the dimensions of empowerment require the Holy Ghost. You need strategy and intelligence to advance kingdom. That's the Holy Ghost work. In Isaiah 32 verse 15, see the way the Bible puts it. When the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, it said the wilderness shall be turned to a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be counted for a forest. That's how the Holy Ghost works. And look at the apostles. Few men afraid, locked away in the upper room, out of fear. The Bible said in Acts 2, 1, 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, suddenly they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. The Holy Ghost descended and cloven tongues as of fire rested on their head. Suddenly they stood up. Strength had come. They stepped out. Peter preached. Acts 2, 37 to 30, 38. Immediately, 3,000 was added to the church. Acts 4, verse 4, he preached. 5,000 was added to the church. A point came. Individuals started taking cities. Acts 8, verse 1 to 5, Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there, the city. So you see that vulnerable, fearful, dejected men who seemingly were hopeless. When the Holy Ghost showed up, they became giants. Until today, the testimonies they bore is still what is helping us to navigate life. That's how he works. Hear me. Your disadvantage can't stop you. There is one who qualifies you. Your weaknesses can't disqualify you. There is one who qualifies you. It is the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will qualify you for kingdom advancement. Don't bother. I can't speak. I don't have money. Those are secondary. Who is sustaining you? If the Holy Ghost is the one, then those things don't count. My business will fail. My business will fail. I don't know anybody. I don't have capital. That is secondary. Allow the Holy Ghost take center stage and see the wisdom that will bring capital. See the strategic connection that will bring men that you don't know. I looked at my life recently, I just shook my head. I said, this God, eh, follow him. As I'm talking to you now, there are many military generals. They are just a phone call away. These are senior men in society. Military generals. Some of them come to my house, rare admirers. Please, let's hold hands and pray together. Where do I know them from? If not by the Holy Ghost. One was posted to Lagos. To head a division there recently, a naval officer, a rare admirer, he said, please, I want you to come to Lagos and dedicate my office. Who am I? Is it vice chancellors? We are supposed to have a crusade in Ghana. They frustrated my friend until one week to crusade. They say, meeting will hold again. When he called me, he said, please, if you have any string, pull it now. I said, give me five minutes. I caught somebody, the person picked from Greece. 
and called the vice chancellor of the university. He just landed London. He was on his way to Boston in five minutes. Even the program they have there on Saturday, they say shift it to Sunday. I'm not even a Ghanaian. That's the Holy Spirit. In all humility, he will exhort you because he's the one that lifted the beggar from the dunghill to establish you among princes so that you inherit thrones. There are kings that give me an honorarium. Kings. I'm not talking, oh, uh, kings. The other day I was in Adamawa State. A king showed up. Be these are people, people beg, please give us place to do crusade. He said, please, I want to sow a seed. And they play the message in the palace. Do you know how many preachers are there? See, follow the Holy Ghost. So. He will decorate your life. You will wonder. Who told you you don't know anybody? You know the one that knows everybody. The heart of kings are in the hands of God. He turns it wherever he wants. I don't want to call names. Because, see, some things are better confidential. I was on a flight. I saw a former chief of defense staff. They said in Bamenda, they've not had any conference there since 2016. Because of us, they extended the time for coffee first. They shut down by 7, but they said now the whole area, people are free to move around till 8.30. When we came to Yaoundé, the whole bill, two people stood up and paid all. You can't come to our country to bless us and you spend your money. Two people paid for the whole bill. From billboard to auditorium to app, they paid the whole bill. We only paid for our flight and few logistics. If you follow him, he will change your story. And it's not because we are preachers, even in your business. I just prayed for my friend who came from South Africa to start a business. That same night, the first person he met as he went to the hotel called people connected to the vice president. And instantly, what would have taken eight months has been perfected in two days because the Holy Ghost showed up. Who told you you are supposed to struggle? Give him time in your life and see him lift you from nowhere to become the envy of your generation. He prospers you. Number three, he causes us to prevail against contrary forces. Luke 4, 14, he returned in the power of the spirit. Matthew 4, 14 and 15, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. See, nothing can withstand you if you allow the Holy Ghost demonstrating his power through your life. And finally, how does this strengthen you? He causes you to live a profitable life. Isaiah 32 verse 16, I quoted already, when the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, it say, even the wilderness can become a fruitful field. Do you know what wilderness is? <laughs> you need to see some. You will be shocked. The other day I was flying to Egypt. I passed through the desert, which is a type of a wilderness. When I saw the, the height of the dust and the dryness, that was death in itself. You will see white sand, like, like story building. Imagine you are flying at 41,000 feet above sea level. It's not a small plane. We were flying a Dreamliner. So they go as high as 41, 42,000 feet. The sand looks as if it's close to you. In fact, if the plane bends, if your, if your heart is not hurt, fear will hit you. You will start imagining things. Let's not sink into this dust. The, the mammoth nature of the dust. And God said when the spirit is poured, that level of dryness can become a fruitful field. And it will not just be a fruitful field, it can become a forest. Nothing can defeat you. And I may go to declare over someone, every crisis you are going through, it goes down now. By the power of the Holy Ghost.
Number five. The last ministry of the Holy Ghost is the revelational ministry. You need light to make progress. And that's what it comes to do in your life. To give you light. And there are three dimensions of revelation. Number one is to illuminate you. To lighten your world. Because the way we see. Listen. When you see your eyes interpret the colors reflected by reason of the rays that fall on them. That means if there's no external light, even if you are not blind, you can't see. That's why if you are in a room, if the light is off, you are not blind, you cannot see. Because your eyes interpret the reflected ray from the refracted ray. When light falls on an object, the object emits that light. Is that light that your eyes through the retina into your brain interprets. So the first thing the Holy Ghost does is that he brings light into your darkness. But he doesn't stop there. The second thing he now does is that he causes you to see what ordinary people cannot see. That's illumination. Because we are in this room now, we are not all seeing the same thing. All of you who are facing the altar, all you are seeing is the altar. If I step back like this, I'm seeing both the altar and the congregation and behind. So by reason of where I'm standing, I have an advantage. In the Holy Spirit, you are brought to a place where you have superior advantage. You can see everything that bore down your life. In order for you to have a glorious destiny. So he comes to illuminate you. This is why Paul was preaching. And Paul said in Ephesians 1, 17 to 21, that... He will grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that illumination activities can begin. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the things freely given to you by God. The second thing he does in the revelational ministry is to show you the strategies for accessing your inheritance. You can have money in the bank and not access it. So it is by the spirit that you know the steps to take to access your inheritance. That's why he said that you may know, that you may know, number one, the hope of your calling. Number two, the exceeding riches of the inheritance of the saints in light. And number three, the exceeding greatness of his power that he wrought when he raised Jesus from the dead. And the third thing he does in his illumination ministry is to upgrade your existence. The more you see, the more upgraded you become. Even in the natural, it's so. Some of you, 10 years ago, you were in your village where you saw all the predominant mode of transportation were bicycles. And people carried home on their neck to farms. That's all you knew. So you could wake up in the morning and loaf around. You migrated to the city. You started seeing aeroplanes. You started seeing people go to work. You started seeing people do great things. You now discover that the way you dress was not good enough. You upgraded. So when you start seeing, you start upgrading. That's how life works. Some of you, you were in the company of people who spoke foul language until you came to a new territory where everybody spoke good English. Without anybody consulting with you, you went to brush up your language. Have you seen some of our brethren who go to, who go America, go to America and, and the UKs? After one week, they come back and say, how you doing? That one is fake, but I mean, that's the pressure. That's the pressure of seeing. Hello, how you doing? How many months have you been in America? I've been there for one week. Uh -uh, one week and your accent has been affected like this. <laughs> but don't blame them. When you see, you must upgrade. So what the Holy Ghost does in upgrading your life is to show you great and mighty things that you know not of. And the more you see them, the more you are upgraded. The more you are upgraded. And a time comes when your life almost becomes the standard for your generation. It's the job of the Spirit. He upgrades us through the things He reveals to us. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise God. These are the five major ministries of the Holy Ghost. What's the time? How many minutes do I have left? What a recap. 
is a burden. Is a burden. <laughs> oh my God. And I also spoke about the symbols of the Holy Ghost. And I said the symbols of the Holy Ghost are not in themselves the Holy Spirit. However, they reflect his nature and his attributes. So when a symbol is used to define the Holy Ghost, it's talking to you about his nature. He's using that thing to define, to help you understand his nature and his attributes. So the Holy Ghost is not a dove. It defines the way the Holy Ghost moves. He descended like a dove, speaking about gentility in his movement. The Holy Ghost is not oil. The oil speaks about the way he rubs off on a man. He permeates and percolates you. So he becomes one with you. The Holy Ghost is not fire. He spoke about, he speaks of the intensity with which he can attain in operation. The Holy Ghost is not water. He speaks of his vastness. So every symbol you see is not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a person. But these things define his character, his nature, and his attributes. And you'll find a lot of them in scriptures. Number one, the Bible speaks of him as fire. Matthew 3, 11, Acts 2, 3, Isaiah 4, verse 4. The Bible speaks of him as the finger of God. Luke eleven twenty, Matthew eleven twenty eight. The Bible speaks of him as the still small voice. First Kings 19, verse 11 to 13, Genesis 3, verse 8. The Bible speaks of him as the wind or the breath of God. Isaiah 40, verse 7, Acts 2, verse 2, John 3, 8. The Bible speaks of him as his descent or his motion as a dove or the landing of a dove. Matthew 3, 16, Luke 3, 32. The Bible speaks of him in the likeness of oil. Psalm 133, verse 1 and 2, Luke 4, 18, John 1, 20, 27. And the Bible speaks of him as a seal, the one that validates the operations of of God. Ephesians 1 13 4 30. You find a lot of it in scripture but the understanding is he is not those things. Those things define his character, his nature and his mode of operation. So when you see anything that defines that, it should give you an idea how the Holy Ghost operates so that it, you can relate with him better. If you come to a place and the Holy Ghost is operating like a dove if you do anything otherwise, you have disaligned. That's why it's not every day you come to preach that you are charging. There are days, where, there are days when it comes like a dove, calmly. That's how the people can be blessed. It's not every day you are praying and you are charging. There are days when it comes like a dove. You need to know that. And there are times when he spreads himself on the people like a flood. At that point, anything is possible. He cannot prove anything. There are times when it sets people on fire and you find everybody running like a mad person. You don't stand and say, what's going on with these people? Ah, they are not organized. Your organization will disalign you. You need to understand. That's why these things are used to define him. Because you can come for certain services. The Holy Ghost comes as a fire, a burning furnace. And those who know him are responding. You see other people who are learned or mature. They are, they are hypocrites. They don't know him. So we don't have a code, so to say. We yield to the move of the spirit. They are generic operations, but every time the Holy Ghost moves, his operation is superior to our generic operations. That's why we discern him and we align to him. And this is what will make you an accurate and effective Christian. So the symbols were there to teach you his operations, teach you his character, and teach you his nature. This is what we dealt with as touching the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go to the doctrine of scriptures. We have 15 minutes. You know, these Bible studies, we don't have time to look at Bible. Our world is a fast-paced world, so we microwave everything. In the days of the apostles, they did Bible studies from morning to night. 
and from night to midnight. If somebody falls, they will wake him up and continue. But in our generation, a, a serious Bible study is for one hour, 20 minutes. Ah, people are super saturated. That's why we need to go back to the cave where we can come for three days and we say we came to study the word of God. We teach from morning to night. You take break one hour, come back. We teach into the night, pray till morning and continue. There was a day I went to the school of medical science in Benue State, BSU. They were on break. The doctors were on break and they said, we have not heard the word of God for a long time. We want you to teach. I said, are you ready? They said, yes. I said, okay. I came around 10 and I stood. I spoke till 4 o'clock. When they stood up, they were stretching like pregnant women. It was like they, they were vomiting the word. They were choked. <laughs> I said, this is how you build capacity. Capacity. And if you don't have a place where they teach you the word like that, see, sometimes on Saturday, wake up 8 a.m., take your bath, sit down. Carry Psalms. Read from Psalm 1 to Psalm 150. Don't stop till 6 o'clock. When you finish, your head will be aching. But your spirit would have been saturated. If you do it for two months, your life will shift. You will shift. Even when you are sleeping, the world will now start talking to you. As you are reading, eh, there's a level you read to, you start praying in tongues. The life will hit you. That's how you will see. You know, real prayer comes from revelation. No? Real prayer. Anybody who prays, who knows the spirit of prayer, is revelation that takes you high. That's why when a man of prayer begins to pray, at every level, scriptures come. Scriptures come. It's those scriptures that move you. Quicken us, oh God, that we might call upon your name. When you are quickened, you call. When you Sit down. Let's, let's touch this. We don't have time. This weekend is Easter. So I want to teach you about salvation next week. So I must finish this. The doctrine of scriptures. Let's, let's maximize our 15 minutes. The word Bible is the word Biblio. And it simply means a book. Now, in the Bible, there are writings... Those writings are called scriptures. The word scripture means writings. So there are scriptures in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is actually a library of books. And each of the books in the Bible has writings called scriptures. That's basic. Every one of us know that. 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books forming 66 books in the library called Biblio or the book, the body of books called Bible. Now when we talk about the doctrine of scriptures, we are actually looking at eight major things because these eight things are basically what forms the doctrine of scriptures. I'll give you seven because of our time. I don't want to touch what I can't deal with. Number one, when we are looking at the doctrine of scriptures, we are trying to examine the authorship of the Bible or the inspiration of the Bible. Where does this book come from? Number two, when we are looking at the doctrine of scriptures, we are trying to study the authority of that book. Why does that book have authority? And why should we pattern our lives after that book? If you don't know this, you don't know the doctrine of the Bible. The authorship or the inspiration of scriptures. The authority of scriptures. Number three, when we talk about the doctrine of scripture, we are trying to study it's inerrancy or infallibility. How accurate is this book? Because it's a risk to pattern your life after a document, a philosophy, or an ideology that is not accurate. Your life too will go in error. 
So inerrancy or inability to err is the third substance of the doctrine of scripture. Number four, when we look at the doctrine of scripture, we are trying to examine the understandability of Bible. Is it clear enough to be understood? Because at a point, we are going to claim that the Spirit of God is the one that inspired it. So if something comes from the realm of God, which, who is a finite and infinite being, can finite beings articulate it? How understandable is this document? Number five, when we look at the doctrine of scriptures, we are trying to study and understand its scope and sufficiency as a body of truth that can give definition to our lives holistically. Is this document, is the revelation from this document sufficient to deal with every aspect of our lives? Because our life seems to border on diverse things, a plethora of things. Number six, when we look at the doctrine of scripture, we are trying to study its canonicity. How did they come about gathering these books? And why are these books the ones gathered? Are there no other ones? What is the basis for selecting these ones and not selecting those ones? The people who gathered it, didn't they make a mistake? We are trying to examine that. And then finally, when we look at the doctrine of scripture, we are trying to also study how to interpret the document, which is what we call the laws or the principles of biblical interpretations. When you deal with these seven things to a very large extent, you would have been able to understand the doctrine of scripture. Now, why is the doctrine of scripture so important? It's important for many reasons. Number one, it affirms to you the veracity of that document. Because if you don't believe and you are not convicted, and I'm not talking just religious assent or acceptance. Because if you are a Christian, it's easy to say, yeah, it's the Bible, it's the word of God, I accept it. The day your faith is challenged, you will discover that your conviction is shallow. This is the undoing of many people. They just accepted the Bible without any understanding about it. And they went to an environment where people began to challenge the document and they didn't know what to say and their convictions began to shake. So it's not enough. We have to study it so that we can ascertain the veracity in order for our convictions to be lasting. Number two, we have to study it so that we can interact with it with the necessary reverence. Because many people carry the Bible, although subconsciously and sublimally, they say, oh, it's the word of God. But they don't relate with it as such. Because they've not taken time to study about the book. So at best, they deal with it as an accurate historical document. Not as the sacred composition of the oracles of God. So we study this so that we can deal and interact with the Bible with the requisite reverence in order to maximize of the things that God has hid there. Number three, why do we need to ascertain this? So that we can open ourselves to be built up by the ideology of the book. Because if you don't really value it, you will not allow it speak to you. And you will not allow it to have authority over your life. Have you seen many persons where you tell them, the Bible said, they say, leave that in, leave that one first. This is what our forefathers were doing. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So they are loyal to the scriptures to the degree that it doesn't contravene the philosophies of their forefathers. But when you study this book, there is a level of understanding that you will have that will make you submit to it completely in order for it to grow you and to disciple you. These are basic reasons why it's important for us to do and to study the doctrine of scripture. And so let's begin taking these seven things one after the other. What I'll deal with here, honestly, is quite basic. Really, really basic. But, of course, it's necessary for us to do this. The first thing is inspiration. The inspiration of scripture. There are many heresies about the inspiration of scriptures. Many postulations in time past until theologians 
came to an agreed position about the inspiration of scripture. And so the first thing I'll deal with under inspiration is to show you how the Bible was inspired. And then the second thing is to give you proofs that the Bible was actually inspired. So on one side, you need to know how they got the message. On another side, you need to have proofs that truly they got the message. It's not just a claim. Because anybody can wake up and claim that a spirit spoke to him. But at the end of the day, there are too many discrepancies that make us question whether it was truly inspired. Because a spirit who knows the end from the beginning should not be taken on a worse if it gives you an inspiration. That inspiration should be able to outlive time. Right? So, two things we look at. Now, let's look at how they caught this inspiration. There were many postulations about the inspiration of scriptures and we came to discover their heresy. So, I list them for you before I show you what is theologically accepted. Number one is the natural theory. What is the natural theory? The natural theory postulates that the Bible is a product of human genius or superior knowledge. This is a theory that these men were so wise. So they were able to gather together wise sayings and they communicated something that is a superior knowledge because they had a superior mentality. But of course, the knowledge of man can be flawed by many things. Number one, time can show inconsistencies. Number two, the knowledge of man will not have the power to generate supernatural happenings. When we see people use scriptures and miracles take place, we know that this thing is beyond man. Number three, the knowledge of man cannot transform. It can renew, it can educate, but it will hardly transform. For a murderer to hear something and change to become a saint, there's a power involved. So if time does not defile it, its natural source will make it vulnerable in the front of supernatural challenges. And if it does not fail in supernatural corridors, its inability to genuinely transform men will bring it to question. So this book is not a product of human intelligence. That theory is flawed. And there are many other theories like that. The second theory is the illumination theory. And this theory postulates that the Bible is a product of man's heightened religious perception. That when men became too religiously inclined, a point came or comes where on the strength of their religiosity and fanatism, they begin to have esoteric feelings, esoteric apparitions. And on the strength of those esoteric experiences, they can write things. So it's their religious persuasion that made them to write those things. It's not necessarily from God. But when we study the scriptures, even the testimony of scripture defies that. Because scripture itself proves that God revealed it. Glory to God. So that's a theory. There's another theory called the mechanical theory. In the mechanical theory, uh, it was postulated that God shut down the minds of the people and dictated the Bible for them, word for word. So they were operating like typewriters. But when we read the scripture, we see that that is not true. Because when you start studying the Bible, you are going to see that the scripture is influenced by the personalities of the writers. You are going to see that the scripture is influenced by historical backgrounds. You are going to see that scriptures is influenced by the belief system and the ideology of different territories part time. That means the personalities of the people also participated. They were not reduced to typewriters to dictate verbatim what God spoke. Are you following that? Then you have the fourth theory, which is what we call the trans theory. In the trans theory, it was believed that these people had visionary apparitions. And they saw, it's like the dictating theory also. But in this case, they didn't hear. They saw visions where they wrote what they saw word for word. Are you following? But of course, the very reason I gave for the mechanical theory also flaws this theory. The fifth theory is the theory of partial inspiration. 
And this theory postulates that only part of the Bible is inspired. The Bible is not completely the word of God. And why do they postulate this theory? They say even Satan spoke in the Bible. Men who didn't know God spoke in the Bible. So we cannot claim that the Bible is, a, is the complete word of God. But you see, when we talk about inspiration of scriptures, we are not just saying the things God said. We are also saying the things God allowed to be written by reason of his authority. Now, this room where we are now, listen this, everybody who entered this room, entered this room on the strength of the authority of EJMI. So the moment you came here, you came under the government of what we are doing here. You can't come here now and start dancing. While I'm talking here, you start jumping and dancing. No. Even if you come here with your own agenda, so long as you are here now, you will come under the government of our oppression. So even the things the devil said, it was God who allowed it to be included in the Bible because he had a purpose in God's agenda. So, although God was not the one who said it, but God was the one who allowed it to be part of the document. So, at that point, the things the devil was saying has an impact in God's agenda. So, it becomes something under God's authority and allowance. Same with the things men said. So, when we are dealing with the story of inspiration, we are dealing with the fact, not just the fact that God alone was the one who spoke. We are dealing with the fact that everything captured there is consistent with the will of God in that God was the one who allowed them to capture it and to document it because he has a place in God's corporate agenda. So the things the devil said are not words spoken by God, but God was the one who inspired it to be captured in scripture. On the strength of that, the agenda of God has something to do with it. So it comes under the government of God's will. That is why it is part of scripture. Are you following this? Number four, which number six rather, the last theory is the thought theory. The thought theory insists that God gave them the thoughts and they wrote it the way they wanted. But this theory cannot be consistent because man fluctuates. So what if you are writing when you are happy, you got tired. You came back when you were sad you, and you, you got tired. You came back when you were betrayed. The book will not have coherence. <laughs> so God can't take the risk of just giving them the thought and say, write it the way you want. That can be a textbook. Paul had parchments. They were not scriptures. There was a difference between Paul's parchments and the scriptures that Paul wrote. Paul said to one of his disciples to come with his parchment when he's coming. So he knew the difference between parchment and scriptures. Parchments are his thoughts. Scriptures are the word that God gave him. So what is the theory of biblical inspiration. The theory of biblical inspiration is called the Weber plenary theory. The Weber plenary theory. What does this mean? This theory simply postulates that the things that were written in scripture it was given by God to the writers through words. And this, these things that were given to the writers through words followed three governments or three protocols. Number one, revelation. Number two, inspiration. And number three, illumination. And I explained to you how these three things happen. The verbal plenary theory postulate that what? The things written in scriptures were given by God through words and they followed the principle of revelation, illumination, and inspiration. Now, according to this theory, what is revelation? Revelation is God imparting the truths that he wanted them to communicate into their heart. It's like God photographed what he wanted them to say into their heart so that the things that were the thoughts of God became their thoughts. It descended like a download into them. That's revelation. 
is divine impartation of knowledge. Then you have inspiration. What is inspiration? According to this theory. Inspiration, according to this theory, is God guiding their souls to be able to receive completely everything he has imparted. You know there are certain things that can come into your mind, but your mind can't receive them. That's why you have subconscious memory, you have conscious memory. So on one part, God imparted the revelation or the truth, which is revelation. Then God now guided their souls to be able to pick what he gave them completely. Not to be contaminated by their own deficiencies. So I can be angry, but God imparts a word of joy in my spirit. God now guides my soul to receive everything he says about joy and he also prevents my soul from allowing my anger contaminate what he said about joy. So I can be angry, yet I'm writing about joy. So the joy that I am feeling while I'm writing is a spiritual joy. It's not something that is happening because of my circumstances. So divinely, God imparts the word and divinely, God coordinates and controls your soul to pick everything he has imparted and only the things he has imparted. And then you have illumination. Illumination is God elevating your soul to a frequency where you interact with him and him only. So when the people were inspired, they received what was in the heart of God. Their soul was guided to receive only what God deposited and their soul was also elevated to interact with only God at the time when they were receiving it. In, in, in a normal human context, let me give you an instance of what happens. As you are seated now, imagine that you've not seen the president before and suddenly the president calls you. You know that while you are standing before him, all your attention will be arrested momentarily. Have you, have you had that experience before? When you are standing before somebody, you reverse so much. A point, you will literally be arrested. All your attention will be glued to him. But what is happening here is superior. So in Revelation, God downloaded. So God stepped down his truth into their hearts. In inspiration, God guided their soul to receive only the download. And in illumination, God hijacked them up. So that they go beyond their human limitations and they receive only what is divinely inspired. So at the time when they received the scripture, everything God downloaded, their soul was able to articulate them. And only those things were their souls interacting with at that time. This is how scriptures were inspired. So when the Bible speaks about the scriptures being inspired, it's talking about three things happening at the same time. Revelation illumination and inspiration. Revelation is God imparting knowledge. Inspiration is God controlling the soul to receive everything and only the things he imparted and illumination is God upgrading the soul of the one receiving so that they can be able to interact with God at that level. This is the technology by which the scriptures were received. And if you study the Bible, you will find it. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 he said knowing this first no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation next verse 21 he said prophecy came not in old time by the will of man are you seeing what's happening here God hijacked them beyond the frequency of their soul so they were not operating at the level of their soul this is what illumination he jacked them up to a higher realm, an ascended realm. So they were operating beyond their will. They were operating beyond their mind. They were operating beyond their emotion. There was an upgrade. He said, prophecy came not. Now, what does it mean came? That's revelation. God sent it, imparted it. He sent the truth to their realm. And then he hijacked their soul up. It's just like meeting at some point. 
where God steps down from his realm and steps you up from your realm so that there's a convergence point, a point where corruption can't exist. So prophecy came with his revelation. Holy men did not speak at their level of their will. They ascended beyond their emotion. He now added something. He said, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. This is inspiration. They were guided. So three things are happening here. Prophecy came. Revelation. Men didn't speak according to their will. Illumination. They were guided. Inspiration. This is how God was able to achieve perfection in transmitting his word. He said prophecy did not come in old time by the will of man. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the spirit of God. He sent it. Men were as elevated to catch it and their souls were guided to receive it without contamination. And this is what happened with every scripture including what Satan said. God trapped it, sent it to their soul and they caught it. Ask yourself the question, were they there when Satan was talking? So who told them what Satan said? It was not Satan that told them. It was God who sent what Satan said to them. Hear what the devil is saying. Upgraded them to receive it so that they can articulate it for a generation to learn. So Romans 15, 4 said, the things that were written aforetime, they were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. There is so much we learn from the errors of Satan. In fact, the errors of Satan can build faith in your heart. He said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He makes you know that they said the devil is. So God was deliberate about what he was doing. Are you following this? So this is the theory of the inspiration of the word of God. If anybody tells you that the word of God is filled with error, bring him here. Let him understand 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Revelation was sent from the realm of God. The souls of men were illuminated, upgraded, beyond their will, beyond their emotion, beyond their human limitation. So they, they, didn't, they didn't let go of their humanity, but they went beyond their human limitation. So emotions can still be there, but emotion can't interfere. The mind can still be there, the mind can't interfere. The will can be there, the will can't interfere. That's why the Bible is speaking in 1 Peter 1.9. He said the things they prophesied, they didn't know what it meant. So they were upgraded beyond their mind. They were writing things beyond their learning. So that their minds, their emotions, and their will can't corrupt it. Although the mind, emotion, will is still there, but operating beyond it. And then they were carried. That means the soul was guided. God made sure he protected the boundary of the soul so that nothing can infiltrate it. So when the scriptures were isolated everything was captured exactly how it was in the heart of God. Are you following this? This is the principle of inspiration. And this is what applies to every scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 It said every scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Not some scripture. Every scripture. It's important to know this. You know, the world has become a smaller community because of internet. You may be here and you say, well, why are we doing this? Some of us interact with the Western world now than we interact with our world here. Because of internet. So that you don't see things and you begin to wonder what's going on. This is why truths like this are important. And it will amaze you that even pastors have not taken time to study these things. It will amaze you. You need to know how your scriptures came. They came from God. This is not a product of human intelligence. And these things are not corrupted because men received them. There was a way God prepared the men who received them. Holy men were carried by the spirit of God. Mind controlled to receive everything and only what God gave. This is the first aspect. What are the proofs of inspiration? I give you five of them quickly. Number one. Number one proof of inspiration is the testimony of scripture. Scripture itself testifies for itself that it was inspired. And I quoted one for you already. 2 Timothy 3.16. It says every scripture is given 
by the inspiration of God. That scripture, talking scripture, every scripture is given. So that's the first proof of inspiration. Second proof of inspiration is the testimony of the authors. I quoted already 2 Peter 1 verse 20 and 22. This was Peter talking. In verse 16, he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. What is that sure word of prophecy? The scripture. And Peter came to say this. He said, knowing this first. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved. So these are those who wrote talking. This is Peter talking. When I wrote the Bible, I was moved. I was carried. I wasn't writing because I was intelligent. The force of God controlled my mind, elevated my mind, and I received the download. That was how I came about this. This is not because I'm experienced. This is not because I'm smart. This is not because I'm intelligent. I was carried. So the one who wrote it, the one who was used to communicate it, is giving you the testimony. Paul spoke in Galatians chapter 1 verse 12. He said, the gospel that I preached, I wasn't taught of a man. He said, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. But by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the testimony of another author. I wrote these things by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And these people knew. Peter was now talking about what Paul wrote. Because if they spoke about themselves only, you will assume that, oh, maybe it's for themselves. How about others? Peter was now talking about Paul. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, hear what Peter said. He said, Go to verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to him, given unto him that he has written unto you. So the, the wisdom by which he wrote it was not his own. It was God who imparted it. Now go to verse 16. He said, as also in all his epistles. This is Peter now validating Paul's writing. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle as they do other scriptures unto their own destruction. You see what Peter is saying here? Peter is calling the writings of Paul scripture. And Peter said, Paul wrote it by the wisdom that God gave him. So even Paul wrote by the revelation of God, corroborating what Paul said in Galatians 1.12. And Peter is saying, there are some people who want to use their brain to operate in this corridor. He said, they now begin to twist it. Because this thing we are talking about here is superior to human knowledge. Every scripture came from God. Nobody wrote it because he's smart. Mark may, read, may have written, Peter may have written, Paul may have written. And for the purpose of understanding who wrote what, they can say the epistles of Paul. But the epistles of Paul are not Paul's, Paul's message. They are not Paul's revelation. They are the revelations of God given through Paul. The epistles of Peter are not the revelations of Peter. They are the revelations God gave through Peter. That is why Peter said what Paul said is also scripture like the one I said. Like the one the prophets of old said. To let you know the proof that scriptures are inspired. And these things are important. You need to meditate on them so that you can not just know them and have conviction. But the day there is a need, you should be able to raise a defense. That what you are reading is not a history book. It's not human intelligence. God gave it. And if they ask you how did God give it, you can explain it. He sent it as a revelation. He upgraded the minds of those who received it by illumination. And he guided their soul to receive everything and receive it how he sent it by inspiration. So there was download, there was upgrade, and there was guidance of soul. This is the three principles that coupled the scripture from the mind of God to the mind of man and to the Torah that we read today as our holy writ. Glory to God. Second proof of inspiration is what? Testimony of the authors. Third proof of inspiration are fulfilled prophecies. Everything they said has come to pass. The ones that have not come to pass are the ones they say will come to pass in the future. Only the messianic prophecies alone 
are more than 500 and no one has failed. That level of precision, and this is something that has spanned many generations. That level of precision cannot be human intelligence. You read your Bible, you see Old Testament prophecies fulfilled, and then Jesus came, and the ones he said, and the ones the apostles said, are being fulfilled every day. That is to let you know. Do you know how many forces can contravene what Jesus said, or what the prophet said? For example, Isaiah prophesied 800 years before that a virgin will give birth. I mean, is it not stupidity for a man to wake up and say a virgin will give birth? Virgins don't give birth. It is against biological law. But he said it by inspiration. And then 800 years later, a virgin suddenly becomes pregnant. And those who were close knew that she didn't know a man. And you say, okay, maybe they manipulated that. The Bible still captures that this child that will be born will be taken to Egypt. And this boy was eight years old. Herod came of all places. It's Egypt they went to. When Herod died, they came back. Of all places that Jesus can live, it is where the Bible says he will live in the land of Zebulun, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And he came and found a house where it was captured. These are prophecies given before he was born. You say, okay, maybe he studied it. That's why he did it. How about the Roman soldiers? That the Bible prophesied that they will pierce him on the side. Did they cooperate with the soldiers who killed him? And the soldiers wanted to pierce him. Of all places, it was the side they pierced. Even his garment that was captured, that they will do lot with it. The same soldiers, as if something was manipulating them, they carried the garment and they cast lot with it. What level of precision is that? Even the prophecies about nations have all come to pass. Does it not suggest to you that what is in this book is beyond human intelligence? There's a spirit manipulating it. So prophecies come to prove that scriptures were inspired. It's beyond human intelligence. Number four, proof of the revelation of scripture are the miracles that happen at the instance of scripture. Everything the Bible says to do to see miracles, do it to see miracles. And when you quote the scriptures themselves, they produce miracles. They are not words of men. He said, these signs, if you follow them that believe, in my name they shall cast out devils. We now go, we say, what's the name? They say, it's Jesus. And we call that name and demons are responding. Who told the demons to respond? And then you don't even need anybody to come around. You carry the scripture. The scripture say, by his stripes you are healed. You now quote it and believe it. And cancer leaves your body. Who educated the cancer? To let you know what you are dealing with is spiritual. So the fourth proof of the revelation, of the inspiration of scripture are the miracle working power that the scripture produces. The fifth proof is the power of scripture to engender transformation. Look at yourself. Some of you looking at me here were scammers. <laughs> My God. You scam 20 people in two weeks. All of a sudden, the scriptures hit your heart and you lost the desire to scam. Some of you listening to me here were drunks. You see Gouda, immediately you start salivating. Gouda, Gouda, Gouda. Some of you is pan wine. In the evening, ah, you go and sit at that joint and they give you pan wine. When you take two cups, you do like this. All of a sudden, this same scripture entered you and the appetite died. You, they drunk. What happened? There is power to transform. To let you know they are not... Some of you seated there were murderers, slaughtered people, slaughtered people, shot people. Your heart was that cold until you heard this same scripture and suddenly conviction hit you. So beyond the theological argument, your transformation to you is a proof that this thing is beyond the words of men. Because some of the people you killed, they beg you, it didn't move you. Please, don't kill me, don't kill me. You butcher them. All of a sudden, now you hear the word of God, your heart breaks. You repent. The other day, somebody sent me a message. He said, I'm a bandit. <laughs> I heard your messages. 
and God had people who are cold. And finally, the proof that scriptures are inspired, it is uncommon consistency. Over 40 writers spanning over 1,000 feet the same message in absolute consistency. You'll never hear any messianic prophet contradict themselves. It's the same thing Isaiah was saying, that Micah was saying, and all of them speaking with the same consistency. And then the New Testament ones showed up and they were replicating it. People of different race, different generations, spanning across different times, yet same message. So you know that this book, the one who gave it, is older than time. So what he was saying 1,000 years ago is the same with what he's saying now. That's why it will be very consistent like that. These are the proofs of inspiration. And it's the first thing you need to understand as far as the doctrine of scripture is concerned. That scriptures are inspired. You know how they were inspired through revelation, illumination, and inspiration. And then you have proofs that they were inspired. Second thing about biblical interpretation. I'll round up in 10 minutes. So write. Let your heart be choked with the word of God this night. Choke yourself. <laughs> Elohim Adonai. Those of you, those of you who love movies, today we will choke you with word. <laughs> if you are watching movie, seven hours, you say, Kai. Is this the last episode? Why did they finish this movie like this now? It didn't finish where? Ah, but they, they, at least he should have married the girl now. At least they should have killed the boss. No boss will die. No girl will be married. Hear the word of God. It says, search ye out of the book of the law and read. None of these things shall fail. The mouth of the Lord that has spoken it, his spirit has gathered it. This book was inspired. It was inspired. Isaiah 34 verse 16. Search ye out of the book of the law. Read. None of these things will fail. The mouth of the Lord, it has spoken it. His spirit gathered it. That's why it is consistent. It was gathered. The Holy Ghost gathered. Precepts upon precepts. Lines upon lines. Here a little. There a little. Those who don't know how to guide, who are not guided by the Holy Ghost to, to gather the puzzle. They are the ones who are stranded. But those who are illuminated, they know the book is precise. Trust me, no book has been debated upon like the Bible. All the scholars, the historians agree that this book is accurate. Second thing about doctrine of scripture is the authority of scripture. Why should the scripture have authority? Why should we live our lives according to scripture? What gives the scripture the authority that it so has? The first thing that gives it authority is the fact that it was inspired. It's the word of God, so it must have authority. Isaiah 34 verse 16, it says, Search you out of the book of the law, read. It says, None of these things shall fail. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. His spirit has gathered it. And Jesus speaking, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4 verse 4, But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus himself made the book an authority because it came from God. It is inspired. So if you live without the word, you are in trouble because your creator says the book should have an authority over you. So why does the book have authority? Because it was inspired. Number two, why does he have authority? Jesus' attestation of the book gives it authority. The one who forwarded the book is Jesus. John 10 35. He said, and the scriptures cannot be broken. That's Jesus' testimony about the book. The scriptures, ye are God's, because you are the children of the Most High. If he says you are God, unto whom the word of the Lord came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, Jesus gave an attestation about the scripture. That's why we cannot not submit to it. Luke 24, 44. 
He said, the law and the prophets, they spoke about me. That is Jesus' testimony about the book. This is why the book has authority. Number three, why does the book have so much authority? The apostles witnessed to it. Luke chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they committed them to us, who were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. They were servants of the scriptures. They served it. That's their testimony. This is the word of God. We are the servants of the world. We are ministers of the world. So if the apostles submit to it, who are we not to? So the witness of the apostles gave it credence. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.16 We were with him on the mount when he received the excelling, excelling glory. He said, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter was saying, we have seen the best of revelations. We saw Jesus transfigured. We heard the father say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We saw Moses and Elijah stood there. We have seen the highest visions. He said, but what is written is superior to those visions. We have a more sure word of prophecy. So the apostles attest that none of our personal experience is superior to scripture. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus was at the Jordan. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The, the, the spirit took him to the wilderness to be tempted. And the devil came and said, if you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. If you were the one, what will you say? Didn't you hear God announce me 40 days ago? Go and ask people. I had an encounter. Jesus said, I'm the son of God. He said it in a stadium. Everybody heard. Jesus didn't use encounters. It is written. It is written. It is written. Why? The scriptures cannot be broken. That's why if you like, go to the third heavens. There's nothing you bring that is superior to it is written. The guide, the guide, the scripture has more authority than your encounter. And in fact, it's the scripture that validates your encounters. We trivialize the Bible in our generation. People come and they tell you all their encounters with Elijah, with Moses, with Enoch, with God, with Satan. I love encounters. I've had some myself. But don't preach your encounters. Preach the word of God. Your encounters can inspire men. Only the word can build men. That's why you find people who go to all these places where they only talk encounter. They are excited, but they don't have stability. Because there's no word in their spirit. They have no regard for the word of God. Why does the scripture have authority? Historical accuracy. There has never been one historical record that suggests that what the Bible said was a lie. Those of you who study biblical archaeology, you are going to see that most of the things the Bible spoke about, archaeologists have discovered. The other day they saw in the belly of the Red Sea, bones of thousands of bones that have been in the belly of that sea for aeons. And they knew those were the bones of the Egyptians that were drowned. Even the Ark of Noah, they found where it stopped. So every day archaeologists are finding things consistent with what the Bible said. So there are historical evidences. And you can go on YouTube today or Google and type. Historically verified evidences of Bible accuracy or Bible truth. They will bring many to you. Every day they keep discovering to show you that the things the scriptures claim are actually true. So it gives the Bible authority because it is consistent and accurate. And then finally, what gives the Bible its authority? Again, I add. It's power of transformation. Anybody who submits to the Bible is transformed. So the Bible can have authority. There is jurisdiction for the Bible to be given that level of authority. Now let's look at inerrancy of scripture or inability of scriptures to err, which is the third major thing about the doctrine of scripture. Why do we believe that the scriptures cannot err or there's no error in scripture? I give you five quickly. Number one, if it was inspired by God, it can't err because God cannot err. And we have seen already that it was inspired. Second Peter 1, 20, 21. Second Timothy 3, 16. 
The Bible should err if God errs. But we have seen that God cannot err. And so if it comes from God, it shouldn't err. So if the book was inspired, then it can err. Number two, why do we believe the Bible is inerrant? Because of the testimony of the Bible. Proverbs 30 verse 5. Proverbs 30 verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Every word of God, another scripture says, is accurate. So the scriptures testify of itself to be inerrant. Psalm 119 verse 160. <laughs> Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgment endureth forever. It says thy word is true. So scriptures attest that scripture is without error. Number three. Why do we affirm the inerrancy of scripture? Consistency in fulfillment of prophecy. And I've said that already. Every prophecy that scriptures postulated has consistently been proven. Number four. Why do we believe that the scripture is inerrant? Jesus himself said that the scriptures don't err. John 17, 17. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is true. Truth. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is what? Truth. John 10, 35. The scriptures cannot be broken. So Jesus himself affirms that the scriptures is inerrant. Why do we believe in inerrancy of scripture? Historical facts that corroborate the assertions of scripture. Everything scriptures affirms, most things rather, scriptures affirms have been confirmed historically. And then lastly, why do we believe in the inerrancy of scripture? Consistency in the message. And I need to say something here about consistency. Now, when you read the Bible, you are going to find certain little, little, little incoherences here and there. And let me outline some for you because somebody listening to me now talking about inerrancy will start quoting something. There are five major classes of discrepancies you find in scripture, but they are not errors. Let me list them for you so that you know and then you know how to explain them. Number one, is differences in numbers and certain details. For example, there are certain passages if you read 1 Kings 4.26 and 2 Chronicles 9.25 where the Bible spoke about Solomon's tables where he keeps his sheep and donkeys. You are going to find certain little, little, little inconsistencies in numerical values. But you see, these things are not necessarily errors. These things are actually a product of the emphasis of the one who is writing. Because when God, if two of us are here, please come up. Two of you come up. Let me show you something. Because every message has emphasis. Imagine both of them are here and they are people that God used to write scripture. My God. Lord, help me. Let me be part of them too. <laughs> Imagine they showed up here now and God wants them to write a message about what they are seeing. To him, God's emphasis might be about the degree of the transformation of these people. God's emphasis may not be about the number of the people. So when he's writing, he can say several people or 50, over 50 people heard the word of God in three months and they were all transformed and they became mighty. Are you seeing that? God may talk to him to write about these same people, but the emphasis may not be on transformation. The emphasis may be on 
how many people were attracted in three months. So he wrote about the degree to which people were transformed in three months. He is writing about how many people were attracted in three months. When this one is writing, he can say 54 people were attracted to God in three months. Now, hope, both, you know, both of them speaks about the power of God. But the emphasis of this power dimension is transformation. So little emphasis is given to number. The emphasis of this power dimension is an akazo, the ability to draw men to God. So he gives little emphasis to transformation. When you are reading from his perspective, you may want to floor this guy. They both got a message from God and the messages are correct, but their emphasis are different. So why this one may not give so many much priority to number, this one will give much priority to number. That is why you may, it may look as if there is little inconsistency. But the truth is, the message that they pass will not change. It will be correct. For example, when you read about the, read from the synoptic gospel on salvation, on the miracles of Jesus, you will find Luke talk about when Jesus was entering Jericho. He said, Bartimaeus was screaming. And then you hear Matthew talk about or Mark, now I can't remember exactly. When Jesus was coming out of Jericho, he heard Bartimaeus shouting. And then you look at it, you say, of course, the Bible is not correct. How can this one say, when Jesus was entering, this one say, when Jesus was coming out? That's not the emphasis. The message is about Jesus showing compassion to the sick and healing them. So their focus was not when they heard the shout. Because if you match the story together, the truth is that Bartimaeus started shouting from when Jesus entered, but Jesus attended to him when Jesus was going. So he shouted from when Jesus entered until Jesus was leaving. But the emphasis of the writer is not when he started shouting. The emphasis of the writer was when Jesus healed him. So they will focus on the action. It takes a man who understands the character of God to know that this guy was screaming from when Jesus came until when Jesus left. So when we speak about inerrancy, our focus are not little, little details that is not the message. Our focus is actually the substance of the message. You will never hear this man say that Jesus didn't heal Bartimaeus. Why this one claimed that Jesus healed Bartimaeus? There will be consistency in the message, sorry, that Jesus actually met somebody blind and healed him. So the goal is the message of healing and compassion and it will be consistent. If you re read about the story of the resurrection, you find these little, little inconsistencies as well. Either with Mary Magdalene or when they showed up and all of that. But that's not the message. The message is, did Jesus die? Yes. Was he buried for three days? Yes. Did he raise, rise from the dead? Yes. You will never see any of the writer claim that Jesus did not resurrect. All of them were consistent that Jesus died. All of them were consistent that Jesus was buried. And all of them were consistent that Jesus rose from the dead. So the focus of God was the message. And each of them downloaded everything about the message. That is why John 21, the Bible said, many things did Jesus that were not written. He said, but these ones are written that you may believe. So God is focused on the message, not the little, little things that were not captured in the message. And you also need to know that these people were writing to different people. So God had to get them to focus on specific things. For example, the writer of Matthew was writing to the Jews. And his focus was to show Jesus as the Messiah, the King. The writer of the book of Mark was not writing particularly to the Jews. His focus was to show Jesus as the servant and the steward of God. The writer of the book of John was writing to focus on Jesus as the son of the living God. So you will find same story, but emphasis different. Why this one is trying to convince the Jewish man that this is the king you have been waiting for. This one is trying to show anybody who believes that this Jesus is servant. And so for you to be accurate with God, you must be a servant. Why John wants to show you that Jesus is the life of God so that you can walk in the supernatural. So the story and the message will be consistent but you need to find out what is the emphasis. So the reason people speak of discrepancies is not necessarily because there is discrepancy. It's either because emphasis is different, historical pers perspective is different, or literary style is different. 
Because when somebody is writing and he's using a different literary style, maybe he is writing and he focuses on personification. Everything he wants to emphasize, he will try to animate it and relate it with human, you know, humans and living things. This one may be using hyperbole. And so everything he's saying is allegorical. You now show up and you are reading, you can't tell that, oh, apart from perspective, there are also different literary style. So this guy can see 1,000 and say a huge multitude. This one can see 1,000 and say, use something. The number of a chariot. Maybe they use number of chariot as 1,000 in that generation. And then you show up, you are trying to contradict it. This is why you also need to understand the law of biblical interpretation. So the Bible does not have error. And the reason we say the Bible does not have error is not because there are no little, little discrepancies. It's actually because the message does not change. There is consistency in the message. If you read the Bible, you will know that the message from Genesis to Revelation is constant. And there's no controversy. There's no discrepancy. God bless you. So anytime, anytime somebody draws your attention to Bible and says, look at this number, look at this, ask him, what is the message? Do you understand the message? If he understands the message, ask him, is there any discrepancy between the two testimonies? If there's no discrepancy, tell him the Bible does not err. Have you been in an accident scene before? Both of you eyewitnesses. Go to where three eyewitnesses narrate story. You will now be shocked what they were all focusing on. So God guides the mind of people to focus on particular emphasis in order to communicate the same message. So that when you see from different perspective, you can have the holistic picture. The message is constant. Glory to God. Are you following? And there's also the discrepancy of um, we don't have the original documents. The documents we have are copies of copies of copies. Because the truth is, the original manuscripts were lost. It is the copies of copies of copies. So maybe you carry the book of Luke. Maybe the copies that were replicated were five copies gotten from people who had 50th copy, 80th copy, 90th copy. That's how they gathered the scripture. So I can have the book of Mark, for example. You can have the book of Mark. He can have the book of Mark. My own may be 35th copy. That's where I got my own copy from. His own may be from 58th copy. His own may be from 100th copy. So there are people who argue that what we have are photocopies. We don't have original. If we had original, we would have had a big problem. You know why? The argument would have been that how do we know it's the original? So thank God we have copies. <laughs> What's the beauty of having copies? If I have copy number 400, you have copy number 250, and you have copy number 30, and each copy are saying the same thing, there is a likelihood that it is correct. Because if it was not correct, the different copies would have passed different messages. So the fact that we have different copies from different eras, from different people, and it is consistent, is a proof that that was a real message. See this message you are listening to now. Imagine that after maybe three years, you take yours home, somebody copies it and go. You take yours own, somebody copies, another person copies. You take your own, somebody copies, another copies, another copies. And then after 10 years, they say, where is that message Apostle Mike preached on the doctrine of scripture? You say, Kai, we don't have the original copies anymore. But this person has the second copy. This one has the fourth copy. This one has the ninth copy. They now say, bring all the copies. They now bring all the copies. And they see that the message is consistent. Then you now know that that's the real message. Because if it was not the message, our copies will vary. But if the copies are consistent, even after many copies, then it's a proof that that is the real message. Are you following? So all of these things can be argued. But let me give you five of them. When we have time, we can study them. But tonight, no time. So the first area of seeming discrepancy is the area of difference in numbers and details. The second area is the area of chronological discrepancy. Chronological discrepancy. Matters that have to do with dates and successions. The third area 
is in the area of genealogy of Jesus Christ. If you study Matthew 1, Luke 3, you are going to see a little bit of differences in genealogy. One speaks of Joseph, another speaks of Mary. It's still about emphasis. So, when you talk, when you trace the genealogy to Mary, you are trying to emphasize the fact that it was a virgin that gave birth. When you trace the genealogy to Joseph, you are trying to emphasize that he is of the lineage of David and Abraham. So, it's still the same story. At the end of the day, when you read the whole document, you are going to discover that he was, his parents were Mary and Joseph. By prophecy, he was the seed of David, and by biological birth, he was the seed of a virgin. So the whole message will now give you the whole picture. But it doesn't mean that it was an error. It's just about emphasis. Because all of these things matter to God. The, fifth, the fourth area of seeming discrepancy is the area of the different accounts of the gospel. But I've told you already, the message is consistent. And then the last area is the area of the question of the sovereignty of God. There are scriptures that prove that God is in control of everything. There are other scriptures that prove that we must take responsibility. So how do we rationalize? It's about doctrinal explanation. If you understand doctrine, you can rationalize the two. Yes, although God is sovereign, but he has given the earth to the sons of men so that we can exercise our free will. So the sovereignty of God makes available, the will of man makes accessible. I can make money available in your account. If you don't go to the bank, you won't have it. So by sovereignty, God makes everything available. By sovereignty, God watches over everything. But by reason of his sovereignty, he allows man to exercise free will. So it is what a man wants that he will have. Are you following? So all of these things have their balances. But the problem with many people is that they don't approach the scripture with sincerity. They don't approach the scripture with humility. And approach the scripture allowing the Holy Ghost to teach them. They come to contradict the scripture. So at the end of the day, they get confused. But when God shows mercy... Sometimes he encounters them so that they enter the substance of the message. We are out of time. I will stop here. <laughs> go and read. Go and read the rest. How many of you will read? So let me give you what we read. How many of you want a note? Let me give my note so that you go and study. <laughs> so there are four more things. The fourth thing is clarity. And clarity is simple. Can the Bible be understood? Of course it can. It can be understood. The Bible said you should be careful so that you don't allow yourself to be beguiled like the serpent beguiled Eve from the simplicity of the gospel. The Bible can be understood. You only need to approach it with purity, with humility, submitted to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing is sufficiency. Is the Bible sufficient? Yes, it's sufficient. Proverbs 10, verse 5 and 6. Write the scriptures down quickly and go and do your study. Proverbs 10, Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Then Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Revelation 22, verse 18 to 19. See what the Bible said. It said, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Verse 6. It says, add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou shalt be found a liar. The Bible is complete, it's sufficient. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I have commanded you, neither shall it diminish aught from it, that ye, may be kept, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I have commanded. Revelation 22 verse 18 to 19. The scripture is sufficient, it's complete. For I testify unto every revelations, yeah, unto every man that heareth the word of prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him plagues that are written in these books. If you add, plagues will be added. The Bible is enough. Please don't add more. Even the ones we have now, we have not uh, consumed all. What we have is sufficient. It says, For I testify unto every man. That he added the word of this prophecy, of this book. If any man add, he said, plagues shall be added unto him. And you know, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 said, According as his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we have all. And when we say all, we say all in the sense that what we have in the scripture is enough to make us know God. 
What we have in the scripture is enough to make us believe in God and in Jesus Christ. What we have in scripture is enough for us to receive salvation. What we have in scripture is enough to bring us into Christian maturity. And what we have in scripture is enough to guide us into eternity. Purposeful and fruitful eternity. So scripture is sufficient. Hallelujah. Then you have canonicity. Go and study about this as well. There are five things that the elders considered in order to gather the books that they have gathered. Because canonicity is simply the art or the process of guiding, of putting scriptures together to make them an authority for the believer. And there are five things. Number one is every book they picked must be divinely inspired. So divine inspiration was the first consideration. Second Timothy 3.16, it says every scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God. So any book that is not inspired, the elders did not canonize. Number two is apostolic authority. Any book that the apostles did not validate was not canonized. And the reason is because they wanted to be sure that the books were consistent with the teachings of, of, of Christ. So only the books validated by the apostles were canonized. Second Peter 3 verse 2 and 16. You saw Peter talking about the writing of Paul to also be scripture. He said that, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. And then verse 16, he showed us how that the writings of Paul were also scripture. The third thing that the apostles considered is the orthodox, orthodoxy of scripture. Whether the teachings of that book is consistent with the general message of the Bible. So any book of the scripture that comes with a message that is different from the general message of the Bible, they didn't take it. Because scripture is supposed to bear witness to scripture. Scripture is supposed to validate scripture. So the elders made sure that only the book, hope you know there are some apocryphas that were not canonized in the early church. You see the book of Tobit. You see the book of Enoch. It's just talking about angels in the seventh, in the seventh heaven. Meanwhile, it's not, it's not, it doesn't align with salvation. It doesn't align with the knowledge of God. It doesn't mature you. It's just talking to you about esoteric things. Talking about angels that rebel. And it even shows you how that some men went to heaven to judge. Come on. So these things, the, the elders saw that the message was not in alignment with the body of truth from other scriptures. So they avoided it. So that you don't come to church and you start talking about Shimiagza. The angel that led other angels to rebellion. And they tell you where he was locked. Oh God. <laughs> Let's just learn salvation and go to heaven. Glory to God. So orthodoxy was the third factor. Galatians 1, 8, 9. You see the emphasis? Paul said, if any man bring another gospel that is different from what has been preached, he said, let him be accursed. He said, again, I say unto you, if any man brings another message different from that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Number four is messages that has influenced the church. So they looked at messages that churches received and transformed them. So if those messages that transformed the church or accepted by the church was inspired approved by the apostolic authority and consistent with orthodoxy, they also included them as canons of scripture. And then number five, historical consensus. When you bring a message, they check the writings of the prophets because Jesus had validated the Old Testament. Is this message consistent with what the prophet said? If it is not, then they cannot canonize it. So there has to be consistency and coherence in revelation. So these were some of the factors that were considered for scriptures to be canonized. When I have time, again, I will deal with laws of biblical interpretation. I know that's where some of you were waiting for. Masters of hermeneutics. God will give us another time. Lift your hands toward heaven and ask the Lord to breathe on his word in your heart. Ha, ha, hey. We're out of time. Now hear me. Some of the things you heard 
You didn't hear them well. Go and listen again. And then study those books. Study those scriptures. Study those references. See, where the world is going to, your faith will be challenged. Though. I'm telling you. You may have good sensations in church. It's good though. Enjoying God's presence. Enjoying God's power. But where the world is going to, your faith will be challenged. These things we are saying that looks like joke. Hope you know that AI is rewriting Bible now and reinterpreting them. And in the nearest future, they will add things that if you don't know the, 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 the severity in staying with what God said, you may take for granted and you may be doomed. And see where our world is going. Many things will be suggested to us and then forced down our truth. They have migrated from technology to internet to robotics, you know, genetic engineering to AI. And you know, the highest level of AI is from cosmic AI to God AI. There are seven evolutions of AI. We are just on, we are entering the third evolution. The third evolution is general artificial intelligence. We are beginning to migrate from artificial intelligence to general artificial intelligence. Because the artificial intelligence we have now is stereotype. It focuses on one issue and deals with it. But general artificial intelligence will begin to handle general things. But there are seven evolutions of AI. The last evolution is God evolution. AI will develop to a level where you have cosmic AI. Where AI will begin to study planetary bodies. Study their movements. Study their compositions. Study their interactions. And they will begin to hope to create planets. To connect planets. And their goal is to see that if there is a possibility of realms that cannot be accessed. Like Hades. Through AI networking. If there's a planet or a place like hell, it can predict it. And using quantum computers, they can trace it regardless the distance or the time loop. So that by all means, they'll look for a way to bridge regions. You don't know where we are going. No. This is why you must know what you know and know it well. Have perfect understanding. So that a time comes when it will be better to die in faith than to compromise. You know, the elders died in faith. They didn't change their confession. Lift your hands toward heaven. One prayer. Lord, help me to stay true with the scriptures. Ah, hey. Father, thank you for your word. This word take root in our hearts. And by the strength of your spirit, we apply them and we produce results in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sit down for a moment. We are shutting down. I apologize for, for taking your time. It's Bible study. Sometimes it's good to stretch you. Now, before I hand over, I have to make this announcement myself. This weekend from Thursday to Saturday, we are going to be in the regions of Kujé. Somebody showed me a post that somebody made. It said, bring the dead. <laughs> when I saw it, I said, Lord, it has been announced. The dead must come back to life. <laughs> Believe me, it's a time of the demonstration of the power of God. And every one of you, I've told you before, be deliberate in participating. Spend time to pray about that meeting. Things happen because men pray. Things don't just happen. Priesthood is what makes things happen. Number two, try to free your schedule. We need all hands on deck. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, join the team and make sure you are actively involved. There will be a, a rally tomorrow taking off from here. I think 3 p.m., right? Be part of that rally if you have the time. Bring your car. Let's make some Holy Ghost noise in Kujé. Let that region shut down. Everybody in that territory must attend that meeting. Let God demonstrate his majesty. And then so towards it. Things happen because men give. Make sure you participate and God will change your life 
from glory to glory. In two minutes, we are out of here. God bless you. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. We can boldly say that this month, most of us have graduated from Bible school. Because some of these things you have learned, if you go to Bible school, you may not learn them. And this principle of uh, biblical interpretation and understanding, like he said, go and listen to them again. Sometimes I'm always scared and what would the future of our children be like? You need to pray for them and intercede for them so that AI will not confuse them. Hallelujah. So be here tomorrow by 3 p.m. We'll be marching to Kuje by 3.30 for the rally. Make sure you participate in prayers. If the power of God does not move, it's because you refuse to pray. So let there be no failure on your account of inactiveness. Hallelujah. So like he said, pray, so and participate. And the Lord will bless you. Let's stand to our feet as we say the closing prayer. In a few minutes, can you ask that the Lord will help this word we have heard tonight to abide? They will abide and they will bear fruit, fruit that will last in your life in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. As we live here, we ask that your presence will tabernacle with us. In Jesus' name we have prayed. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Kadosh, kadosh. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh.